the NFL Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, nearby Fawcett Stadium, 50,000 cramming into this little town for what is truly a slice of Americana Hall of Fame enshrinement day today. 24,000 plus will be in the stadium, a spectacular Hall of Fame day here in Canton, Ohio. And we welcome you to that. I'm Frank Gifford with Al Michaels and Dan Deerdorf. We also welcome you to the kickoff of our 26th season of Monday Night Football. And traditionally, we open here in Canton, Ohio. And today we will have a first for you and a first for the two expansion teams. They are both undefeated as they come into this one, Jacksonville and Carolina. And Al, I guess you could say expansion in the NFL, however, is not like it used to be. Those old expansion teams didn't have the benefit oh, of free agency. So these teams have some big names. Just a thumbnail sketch. First, the Carolina Panthers are coached by Dom Capers. He was the architect of the recent great Pittsburgh defenses, so the premium is on defense. They'll play a 3-4 offensively. Frank Reich, who banked up uh, Jim Kelly at Buffalo for several years, will be the quarterback. We'll see a lot of Kerry Collins. Jacksonville is coached by Tom Coughlin, who could have had the Giants job two years ago, opted to stay at Boston College. Tom Coughlin has been on the job for over a year, so his program in place, his staff in place, his quarterback will be Steve Berline, formerly of the Raiders, the Cowboys, and the Cardinals. We'll detail the players, of course, as we go along, but Dan, in addition to, from a PR sense, each team would like to win the game, of course, but really, what are the coaches want to come out of today's game with? Well, I think Tom Capers and Tom Coughlin out uh, can look at things a little bit different than their brethren of the other 28 teams around the NFL, and that is simply this. Those other clubs are all making decisions on personnel trying to get ready for the opener on Labor Day weekend. Well, I think that these two guys have a luxury in that, well, yes, they're trying to put on a representative ball club here for the 95 season, but they're making decisions on personnel for the opener two and three and four years down the road when they are realistically uh, going to be in a position to make a run for a playoff spot. But Carolina, both North and South, and the Jacksonville Jaguars are in the National Football League. It has been a long struggle for both of those cities. They have expended great deals of energy and money, but they're about to bear fruit this afternoon. On behalf of everybody else in the National Football League to the Carolinas and Jacksonville, welcome to the big show. So a historic game in Canton, Ohio on a very hot day. Temperature approaching the 90 degree mark, but no threat of rain. It's nice and dry. And a chance for each franchise to make its NFL debut. Tom Coughlin was an assistant coach with the New York Giants in the 1990 season, and that meant he was a man who has a Super Bowl ring because the Giants defeated the Buffalo Bills in Super Bowl 25 in Tampa, then went to Boston College. We mentioned had a chance to coach the Giants when Ray Handley was fired a couple of years back, turned it down, and then the right situation for him came along in Jacksonville. So he took the job, and he has been in place since February of 1994. He's been a coach without a team to play a game with for about 17 months. And on the other side of the field, Dom Capers. Now, when Carolina was granted its franchise, clearly one of the people who was available had he decided to come back into coaching was Joe Gibbs of the Redskins but Joe was not ready to get back into coaching so the Panthers turned their attention to other prospects and in fact they were so hot to get capers that in effect they tampered because Dom had been coaching the Pittsburgh Steelers in the playoffs last year but Carolina wanted to get him in place and in position and so they signed him before they legally could have, and it cost them some money and a couple of draft choices. That's how much they wanted Dom Capers. Of course, he was highly sought after, and one of the young coaches to come to the fore in the last few years. But I think Dan's going to be interesting to see what kind of offense they bring to this expansion team. They had to take players perhaps that they didn't want to take that would fit the type of offense they wanted to go. We, you know, we would know what Pittsburgh uh, was doing with their 3-4 defense. They're back to a 3-4 defense. But what are they going to do offensively? Uh, and what uh, are we going to see from uh, head coach Tom uh, Coughlin? This is in Boston College. Uh, will it resemble... Um, Will it resemble the offense under Bill Parcells when he was last for the Giants? Well, what offense we see from Jacksonville, we'll see led by that guy Steve Berline, who uh, still has a lot of good football. He's, you know, been around. His, his stint with Al Davis and the Raiders wasn't very satisfying. He ends up with Buddy Ryan in Arizona. That wasn't very satisfying. And now uh, he gets a shot at it here in Jacksonville, although you get the impression that down the road Mark Brunel is the guy they're looking for. And there is the Southpaw Brunel, uh, formerly with the Green Bay Packers, and 
the best arm in this Jacksonville camp, and we'll get a good look at him uh, this afternoon. You have some uh, famous quarterbacks, if you're wondering about that. Uh, Andre Ware, you might wonder where he was uh, last year. He was cut by Minnesota, didn't play last year. And now coming out on the field, this is Frank Reich. Remember him of great Buffalo fame three years ago and pulling that playoff game, 32 points down in the fourth quarter to defeat Houston. He looks like the starter, at least uh, initially, but uh, then they turn around and take Kerry Collins after they'd signed Frank Wright. Kerry Collins, the rookie first round draft pick out of Penn State. So it's going to be a quarterback <laughs> battle. This is a weekend uh, long in pomp and circumstance. Uh, uh, it's normally a festive weekend because of the inductees into the Hall of Fame, but of course it is just magnified tenfold by the fact that it's two football teams uh, walking onto the field for the very first time. And the excitement level here, there are thousands of fans from both Jacksonville, Otto Graham, you see right out there. Get out of the way, Otto. <laughs> he can still move. Our toss today will be with a ceremonial coin honoring the Pro Football Hall of Fame for 1995. Tails, heads, the ceremonial toss, and the actual toss called by owner Mr. Richardson, if you'll call it while it's in the air. Red Cash in the referee. Heads is called. Heads is the call. Your choice. They'll receive. Carolina won the toss. Chose to receive. Gentlemen, let's play football. So the Panthers and the Jaguars. Teams numbers 29 and 30 in the NFL. The Panthers and Wayne Weaver is the founder and owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars. His team has been placed at least for this season in the AFC Central. And that means uh, they'll have to contend with the likes of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Cleveland Browns, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Houston Oilers. The you Carolina Panthers go into the NFC West. Good luck to them with the 49ers, of course, heading that division. Can you imagine the feelings right now going through Messrs. Richardson and Weaver, uh, their staffs, their, their cities, their communities, who have labored for four and five and six and sometimes ten years putting together an expansion effort and, and finally seeing it bear fruit here in Canton, Ohio this afternoon. There must be a lot of... Uh, a lot of swollen hearts and bursting prides all around these different cities. All the work that went into it, and then you spent three or four years not knowing if you'd even have the opportunity. Then the great day came for each franchise, and now it comes to fruition. Here it is in living color on the 29th day of July. Scott Sisson, formerly with New England, and he at the moment is the number one place kicker for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He'll put it in the air. And Randy Baldwin and Tony Smith are back deep to receive for the Panthers. Randy Baldwin with Cleveland last year, one of the best in the league at running back kicks. He's number 23. Tony Smith, the former Atlanta Falcon. Baldwin actually led the AFC in kickoff returns a year ago and is really making a strong bid to <laughs> be a starting running back. And, well, a little confusion, you might suspect. And we're going to flip-flop. The Jaguars say they wanted to defend the west goal, and they were lined up defending the east goal. So not a very good start, is it? Well, they'll remember it forever. Everything they do, they'll remember forever here. And Dan I, sw I, spoke of the swollen <laughs> pride. How about the lean pocketbooks? These well, two franchises costing about $140 million oh, yeah. plus just going in. Oh, and that is the upfront money. You factor in the... Uh, the loss of uh, television revenue, they operate with less of that for the first three seasons. The price tag for an expansion team this time around, these two cities, uh, it's closer to $200 million that they've expended to reach this stage where they can set up for a kickoff and then have to run to the other end of the field and do it again. And then the ball falls off the tee. Yep. Well, sooner or later, hey, if you waited seven years, the heck's another three minutes, right? Savoring every moment, I guess you could say, out. So Scott Sisson of the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Jaguars in white, kicking off to the Carolina Panthers. And we're underway in Canton, Ohio. The kick floats to the nine-yard line. Randy Baldwin runs it back up the middle all the way out to the 39-yard line. 30-yard return, and Frank Reich 
out of the University of Maryland in his 11th year but for so many seasons the backup to Jim Kelly though he did make the most of his relatively few starts Barry Foster the ex Steeler Bob Christian the ex Bear Don Beebe the ex Bill along with Mark Carrier the ex Brown are the White House and Pete Metzelars formerly of Buffalo at tight end X and formerly words we'll use a lot today constantly <laughs> This is Barry Foster, acquired from Pittsburgh in a trade. And next to each man's name, we'll show you his most recent team, except for the rookies. And they have two on the left side of the line. Brockermeyer, one of their number one draft choices, and Peterson, two rookies on the left side. Whitley from the Chargers. Boatswain played with the champion 49ers. And Derek Graham of the Kansas City Chiefs, the interior five. A lot of mixing and matching up front for both teams, obviously, when they bring together the offensive lines. It'll be second down and six at the 42-yard line. And time is called as they, I believe, get the clock back in order. For Frank Reich, he can look around that huddle and see very familiar faces. Uh, Metzelars from the Buffalo Bills, fine year last year for Buffalo. He worked, of course, a lot with him in practice. And Don Beebe out on the outside, very familiar to Frank Reich. And that would figure because Bill Polian is the general manager of the Carolina Panthers and had a great deal of success with Buffalo, helped to mold the team that won four consecutive AFC championships. So Polian, when he's dealing with his former players, knows all about them, and that's why you have a, a very heavy Buffalo influence with the Panthers. Second down and six up at the 41-yard line with Foster in motion. And Frank Reich with a short drop. And the first pass is complete to Mark Carrier, who makes the catch at the 48-yard line. Just a little shy of the first down. It'll be third and one. Now Jacksonville defensively. Logan Pritchett, the ex-Lion. Don Davey played at Green Bay. And Jeff Lagerman, the biggest of those names, the former Jet. Problems in the middle, though. Williams, Goganius, and Williams are the linebackers. They are weak there. Somebody has to emerge. Clark and Washington are experienced corners. Colin and Carrington are experienced safeties. So a lot of former starters, but again, as is the case with both teams, mixing and matching. 40 second clock will be kept on the field. Come on! So Rick Cashin sorts out the clock problem. It's one of the problems, obviously, you're going to have at a, a stadium that doesn't host but one NFL game per year. Third down and one now for the Panthers at the 48-yard line. Just the start of things, the two expansion franchises freshly minted. Double tight end set with Pete Metzelar's 88 and Kurt Hawes, 89. And with Hawes in motion, Barry Foster works his way up to the 49-yard line, and it's going to be very close to a first down. It will probably require a measurement. You, you said a big decision by Dom Capers. I think it's going to be just a little bit short. We're close to midfield. What do you do the first time around? Well, Don said those are the uh, Don said those are the decisions that he's going to make himself. He's going to punt it away. He's a coach that is going to allow his coordinate uh, coordinators to go ahead and call the plays, both offensively and defensively. He's going to restrict himself to game decisions. You know that's always a, a tough deal. And there are his coordinators upstairs. Joe Pendry is uh, his offensive uh, coordinator. Vic Fangio on the left is defensive coordinator. And you know that has to be a tough call. You're an assistant coach all your life. You, you know you say to yourself, if I ever get to be the head man, I, I know I'm going to treat my assistants with respect and let them do their job because that's the way you wanted to be treated. And uh, Dom Caper is one of those guys when he got the corner office, kept true to his word. And the first first down history of the Carolina Panthers chalked up by Barry Foster the Panthers now at their own 49 yard line first and 10 just two minutes into the game in Canton Ohio before what will be a record crowd since they added uh, about 1200 more seats and with the interest from uh, Jacksonville and the Carolinas, probably could have put another 20,000 people into this stadium. Easily. Foster again. 
to the 50-yard line. The question with Foster, we know how good he is. His numbers reflect that. Can he stay healthy? That is the whole key for Barry Foster. Well, two years he had that big problem with the ankle. It's still troubling him somewhat that they're going to just kind of live with it. Uh, he had 1,600 yards before that ankle, and he sort of limped through the season of 93. And there's a big question mark about that. You're right, Al, whether or not he's going to hold up, particularly behind this offensive line, which is certainly not the Steelers' offensive line. On second to nine. White. Good protection, but then throws it away. Throws it at the feet of Foster, so his line did its job, but so did the Jaguar secondary. He might have been trying to set up a screen, and uh, Foster was well covered on the play. And a good move by Reich. He knew the screen wasn't there, just dumped it off. Very heady move. It'll be interesting to see now if he has an opportunity to go to number 82, PB, or his big tight end, Metzlars. Metzlars, of course, with big numbers for Buffalo the last two years, the big tight end at six foot seven makes a great target. Third and nine from the 50 yard line. Four man rush. Wright stays in the pocket, throws, complete to the 40 yard line. Willie Green makes the catch, and that is a first down. Willie Green with Tampa Bay last year. Not big numbers. Five receptions. 52 for his entire career, and he's in his fifth season. Just a quick slam in and a good look by Reich and a good delivery. And Denny Clark, who is known for good coverage, man-for-man -man coverage, not, not a tremendous amount of speed. He was the number one draft pick at Green Bay a few years ago, and things just didn't work out there. It didn't work out in Atlanta either. It didn't work out in New Orleans, and here he is with his fourth team in only his fifth year. The Carolina Panthers with back-to-back -back first downs. They're at the Jaguar 40-yard line. This is the seventh play of the drive, and Reich floats it over the head of Bobby Christian, the fullback, coming out of the backfield. The former Chicago Bear covered on the play by Keith Goganius. Second and ten. When you talk about Carolina's passing game, though, and, and Al, you touched on it with, with Metzelars and Reich and, and Beebe, that's a that's a an offensive passing coordination that is that you automatically have because of the years that they have spent on practice fields together and it does give Carolina an edge that other expansion teams haven't had the ability to put veterans who still can play but yet who have a background together on the same expansion team it's a real leg up for the Carolinas especially in the passing game and then you factor in uh, Mark Carrier into that equation, uh, who, who came from Cleveland, an excellent receiver. Carolina's got fine receivers. No question about that. When you look at these expansion teams again, we talked about it earlier, the quality of player is so much better than it was when they last expanded to the NFL in 76 with Seattle and Tampa Bay. There's just no question about it. Well, these two teams had access to players that no expansion team before has ever had. On second and ten, he draws. And Hillander oh, gets taken oh, down hard by James Williams after a gain of four. That was a mid-season hit. Williams came over from New Orleans in the expansion draft. He had seven starts down there. So again, we're looking at a player who is not proven himself to be a Pro Bowl type of player, but certainly is capable of starting in this game. When you look at the pool of players that these guys had available to them, either through free agency, through the expansion draft, and there were good people available in the expansion draft because of the salary cap. It really, it's an unprecedented collection by both of these teams. On third and six, the pass was right there. They want a flag. Al Jackson covering Willie Green, but there is no flag. Great coverage by Jackson. Green can't make the catch. And it will be fourth down. More on that, Dan, I'm not sure exactly the numbers. There was something like over 350 players made available as unrestricted free agents. And out of that, 179 of them moved. And that is a big shifting around of personnel. A lot of those guys had big salaries, and the salary cap just didn't allow their teams to keep them. From that angle right there, it looked like uh, Al Jackson timed his, uh, his hit on Willie Green pretty well. So it is fourth down and six now at the 36-yard line. And Carolina is going to take a delay of the game penalty. They're in that no-man's land here where they don't want to kick a field goal. 
and run the risk of having Jacksonville take over at about the 44-yard line. And yet it's almost a full six to right. go for exactly. the first down. Exactly. Six for a first Play. down. By the offense, the distance is declined. <laughs> it's fourth down. What you call a standoff. Yeah. And they, they figure they had nothing to lose, that if uh, Jacksonville would give them those five yards, they'd have that much more room with which to maneuver. I think maybe uh, Tom Coughlin's going from Jacksonville. Hey, we may be an expansion team, but we're not that dumb. Mm -mm. We're not gonna, I'm not expansion. <laughs> we're not going to give saying. you. We're not going to give you what you want that easily. Even in the first preseason That's game, right. we know what we're doing. Tommy Barnhart, the former New Orleans Saint, kicking to Desmond Howard, the one-time Heisman Trophy winner at Michigan, who played with the Redskins. A floating kick. And a beauty that bounces inside the 10 and is down at about the 11 yard line. And that's where the Jaguars will take over. Four minutes and 27 seconds into the game in Canton, Ohio. The AFC NFC Hall of Fame game on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Cadillac and your Cadillac dealer, creating a higher standard. The makers of Advil in tablets or caplets. Pringles, so fresh, once you pop, you can't, you can't, you can't stop. And Beachwood Age Budweiser, the king of beers. This Bud's for you. Our first look now at the Jacksonville Jaguar offense. Quarterback is Steve Berline. They plucked him in the expansion draft. Eighth year in the league, went to... Notre Dame was a Raider, a Cowboy, and most recently a Cardinal. Reggie Cobb, formerly with Tampa Bay last year, Green Bay, and Lachey Mastin from Houston. The running backs, Howard and Tillman, are the wide receivers. And Derek Brown, a couple of years ago, the Giants' number one draft choice, the tight end. Bruce Wilkerson comes over from the Raiders. Sean Bowens from Detroit, Dave Wydell from Denver, the center, Tom Islinski from the Bears, and Brian DeMarco, a rookie from Michigan State at right tackle. And their first play from scrimmage, a running play to the outside, goes Reggie Cobb for a loss of two yards. Darian Connor making the tackle. Well, this is what it looks like if you're the guy carrying the football, and it is just penetration upfield, and, and if... There is to be a problem for Jacksonville in moving the football. I think it's going to be with Darian Connor on one side and Lamar Lathan on the other. Whether in the run game or the passing game, I'm not sure Jacksonville knows how to handle both of these guys pinching off the corners. And a whistle just as the ball was snapped, so Red Cashin will give us the call. Compounding the problems for Jacksonville is the fact that Boselli, the number one pick at left tackle, is not available. He has an injured knee. Novak on the right side, right tackle, he would be a starter, he's unavailable. Before the ball was snapped, false start. Number 87 on the offense, half the distance to the goal, still second down. Uh, Faselli's injury, you're right, Frank, forced him to juggle the whole deal. Wilkerson should be on the right side, DeMarco should be a backup, and now they're both having to play out of position. And given the state of that offensive yeah. line, you might be looking around the huddle calling for volunteers. Panthers play a 3-4, and that's the strength of the defense. Lathan, Mills, Butcher, and Connor especially the outside backers and some veterans in that secondary McHire and Smith on the corners Bubba McDowell and Brett Maxey are the safeties so each team featuring a lot of players who have started a lot of games through their careers it is second and 17 after the penalty and Reggie Cobb gets it back to the original line of scrimmage which was the 11 it'll be third down and 10 and Reggie Cobb is slow in getting up and that means we will probably get an earlier look than we had suspected at their number one draft choice and there he is James Stewart the all-time leading ground gainer in the history of the University of Tennessee so Cobb shaking on the play an injury timeout 923 to go first quarter Jacksonville nothing Carolina nothing yeah, 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 yeah. Keep an eye on number 22 in the middle of your screen. That's Tim McKayer. He's going to come in. He hits Reggie Cobb. A good tackle. Hits him on the thigh, but Cobb had that right foot planted. Got it up fairly quickly, but you could see the uh, the flexing there of the right knee of Reggie Cobb. He goes over to the uh, to the sideline, and as Al said, we'll get our good look at, uh, at James Stewart, and there's a look at the much-traveled Tim McKayer. 
49ers, Dolphins. It's it, it's an extensive list. Six teams. Well, the last time anybody saw Tim McKayer, he was beside himself. He was beaten by Tony Martin of San Diego in the AFC Championship game for the game-winning touchdown that sent the Steelers home and the Chargers to face the 49ers. Third down and 10 now from the 11-yard line. No score. 9.23 to go in the first quarter. Burline avoids the sack and throws on the run, and the pass is caught up at the 32-yard line by Desmond Howard. Nice play. Lamar Lathan had a hold of Burline's jersey, but Steve was able to shake him and throw it upfield to complete the pass. And he showed a lot of poise on that. He had about 10 yards to go for the first down. He could have perhaps picked it up, but he looked around the field, maintained his poise, finally picking up the receiver downfield under a lot of pressure. Now watch, right here he could have taken off and run with it. Lamar Lathan gets the, gets, gets the corner on, on Brian DeMarco, the right tackle. That's going to be uh, as long as Lathan remains in the game. A, a tough spot for DeMarco, but a big, big play for Jacksonville. 21-yard pickup. First down from the 32-yard line. Burline protected well, then throws, and it's incomplete. Cedric Tillman looks around for a flag and gets it. Rod Smith with the coverage. They plucked him from New England in the expansion draft, and the flag is down at the 40-yard line. Good job here by DeMarco as he keeps Lathan out of there. But you see Gerald Williams gets around and gets in and makes the hit. Williams working from the nose tackle position. This is Rod Smith at corner number 21 at top. And there's no question about that. He goes all the way through Tillman with the body contact before the ball arrives. Not bad. Almost midway through the first quarter and the first flag. Yeah, we've got a first interference. Well, I think before this day is over, we'll have... We'll have notches in almost all of our categories. First and ten after the penalty. From the 40-yard line. The drive that began at the 11. Ball come up. Take to Stewart. Here they come, but Burline throws. And it's nearly picked off as Rod Smith was there and Desmond Howard, in effect, turned into the defensive back to try to prevent the interception. Well, Double blitz on the inside that time by Carolina. You know, and Berline read that. You don't see many changes in a game like this, almost like a scrimmage game. He changes off to a fly, seeing that he had one-on-one -on -one Desmond Howard and Rod Smith, and Rod Smith played that really well. They picked up the blitz on the inside. Berline got what he wanted, single coverage, but Smith made a great play. Right up to the point where he should have caught it for the interception. He was... You saw Andre Ware. We probably won't see him today. We will see Mark Brunel. And uh, Gene Stewart goes nowhere on his first pro carry. Coming up to make the tackle was Mike Fox, the free agent pickup from the New York Giants, to whom they paid a good deal of money to the uh, surprise of a lot of personnel people around the league. Fox collected a, well, a... a contract really commensurate with his size. Mike is a 6'8", 288, and he got a lot of money, and it sent uh, shockwaves uh, through the uh, through the NFL. A lot of people thought that uh, the Carolinas overpaid for Fox, that they were driving the marketplace to places they didn't want it to be. And it didn't get them off to a great start in the eyes of the other 28, 29 teams, but they were excited. Caroline flushed out of the pocket, looks downfield. Good coverage by the secondary, and Steve is taken down by Tyrone Poole at the 44-yard line, and the Jaguars will punt for the first time. There's a kid, by the way, Tyrone Poole. Uh, keep an eye on him. He's number one draft choice of, of Carolina, and he hits anything that moves, and he is one of the highlights of Dom Capers and his Carolina camp. They are, they think they've got a guy that's going to be a factor in this league for a long time. So he comes on the blitz yep. and now in pursuit of Berline. Berline's a fine athlete. He'll do a good scramble job for you, keeping his <laughs> poise, looking downfield, and that was a good move by Poole, as you said, showing a lot of speed, Dan, to get back into that play. Only 5'8", but he's, uh, he, came to, he, he comes to play. He's going to hit people. Brian Barker, the former Eagle, to punt it. Vernon Turner, the veteran punt return man, takes it at the 17-yard line, runs into his own man, and then another. And down he goes. Vernon with the Bills and the Rams and the Bills again in Tampa Bay and now playing with Carolina. Carolina and Jacksonville. 6.15 to go in the first quarter in Canton. Nothing of it.
Well, this is Dan Deerdorf territory as we take a look at the resting site of the former president of the United States, William McKinley, as the Goodyear blimp spirit of Akron for the first time ever floats above Fawcett Stadium. They weren't here covering any of my high school games. I wouldn't think so. Next week, though, we're on. We get back to night games. We're back. Uh, we're back working uh, uh, without the bright light on us. We're out in San Diego. The Vikings and the Chargers. The first of uh, three consecutive Monday nights where we're back in our proper element, gentlemen. And keep in mind, our preseason games start an hour earlier than our regular season games. That's an eight o'clock start, five o'clock on the West Coast for the Vikings and the Chargers. A week from Monday. Then we're on to Cleveland and then on to Denver, I believe, right? That's Cleveland against Chicago and then Denver meeting Dallas. Carolina has the ball at the 21-yard line. Frank Wright on first and 10. Throws to Christian. And the fullback is taken down at the 25-yard line. Tackle made by Mark Williams. And let's get our first report of the season from our esteemed colleague, Mr. Lynn Swan. Swanee? Thank you, Al. Uh, Canton has not missed out on the weather, the heat that's crossed our nation of high temperatures, but we got a break today. It's only 87. Low compared to the mid-90s and hundreds both these teams endured in training camp. They've done a number of things headed for this ball game. They've kept the practice down to under two hours. No double days back-to-back, -back, but they've taken the precautions. They've hydrated. They've educated the players on the symptoms of dehydration, and they're going to substitute liberally to make sure that no one suffers from heat today, Al. All right, thank you, Lynn. As Christian picks up three, they get a break, as you say, with the humidity. The humidity just 51%. It'll be third and three. Jeff Lagerman made that last tackle. So it's just the four of us that have to go the distance here. Huh? <laughs> Swanee's under the bright light out there, though, Lynn. I'd seek some shade if I were you. Mm -hmm. The uh, Carolina Panthers have, uh, uh, have chosen to stay in the Carolinas as they're training down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. But uh, Jacksonville has gone all the way north and uh, joined the Cheese League as they're up in Wisconsin with a number of other NFL teams. And it's only been hot up there a couple days. Really, uh, it's been uh, a little cooler than, uh, than Tom Coughlin would have liked. Third down and three. And Frank Wright taking a little too much time. And going with that geography is the fact that Jacksonville has been in camp for three weeks now. <laughs> or out of anyone else. By the offense. Five yards, still third down. These are the kinds of penalties you're going to get, and you usually get in the Hall of Fame game, but they're less and less, and we've watched it over the years, as they spend more time with minicamp, they work more on the playbooks, they work during the offseason. This is almost a full-time job now, and this game is a much neater game than it used to be when the players would come together in July and you'd get, get them two weeks later. Between the mandatory camps and the quote-unquote voluntary camps, you're right, they are working year-round. Third down and eight now from the 23-yard line. Blank under pressure. Goes against the grain, and Barry Foster was the intended receiver up at the 25-yard line, and even had it been completed, would have been considerably shy of the first down. So it's three and out for the Panthers. And again, we find uh, that we've got James Williams in on a play. Reich forced to roll, but James Williams... Gets a bruised shin out of this, I think. The ball. That ball hits him on the left shin. That, uh, that's the kind of play where Frank was just intending to throw it away completely, but gets the ball a little closer to an interception than he would have liked. Tommy Barnhart kicking toward Desmond Howard. 42-yard kick. Hello! And Desmond Howard Goodbye. gets by Barnhart. They're not going to get it from behind, and that's the first touchdown in the history of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And it was beautiful. Desmond Howard, who struggled so mightily with the Washington Redskins, they finally made him available and has looked awfully good for Jacksonville in training camp. Breaks the first touchdown for Jacksonville. Well, whether it was back in his big play days at the University of Michigan, where he won the Heisman Trophy, or... Wherever he finds himself, if Desmond Howard has the football under his arms, big things can happen for him. Traffic like this, yeah. he reads it perfectly. You can't try to take it to pick up a picket line. Well, he wasn't even touched. No. A couple of jukes and turns on the speed. We know he's got that. A beautiful return. Nary a Panther got their claw in Desmond Howard. <laughs> <laughs> a 66-yard run back. Scott Sisson to attempt the point after. 
with 4.13 to go in the first quarter. The freshly minted Jacksonville Jaguars, thanks to the Heisman Trophy winner from Michigan, leading the Panthers 7-0. The NFL preseason schedule beginning today, and what a beginning for the Jaguars. Their first ever touchdown, a 66-yard punt return by Desmond Howard in three years at Washington. Howard ran back a total of 109 punts, one of them for a touchdown, that coming in his rookie year, 1992. Mike Hollis will now kick off. He and Scott Sisson battling to be the Jaguars' number one kicker. Tony Smith and Randy Baldwin are back for the Panthers. Hollis out of the University of Idaho. And it's a short kick. It bounces at the 20 and bounces back. That's a free ball at the 27-yard line. It is a loose ball. And the Jacksonville bench they sure seems it. to think that they have it. Nothing yet from any of the officials. Well, though. it may have changed hands a couple times already, as we well know. <laughs> <laughs> that thing will be a tatter if it comes out of there. Line judge trying to work his way in there. Don Capers looking on. And it does belong to Jacksonville. Lachey Maston comes up with the football. So a couple of special teams mistakes here by Carolina have got them in a hole. That wasn't even You're right. Close. No, Maston had it, and he kept it. That ball poorly played by the deep man. You have to know that on a grass field like this, he's not going to take a, an artificial surface bounce. You've got to be playing that ball, even if you have to short hop it. I guarantee you Brad Seeley's breaking into a sweat after a couple plays like <laughs> that. Yes. From the 27-yard line. First and ten and contact up front before the snap. Tyrone Rogers and Bruce Wilkerson making contact. Uh, Wilkerson uh, sacrificed himself for his team, I think. Unless somebody up there flinched. False start. Number 68 on the offense. Oh, well, he didn't. Five say yards, <laughs> still first down. Well, then you not only made the mistake, Bruce, but you paid the price, too. He's second from the top, and he flinched there. You could see the tail end of his flinch, and then he gets hit as a result of such, and tack off five against the Jags. You know, I'll be the first. I'll get a letter. They don't like the Jags. They don't, it's got to be Jaguars. <laughs> Better than call them Cougars. <laughs> now, one of now, us Frank, can do that. We have, <laughs> now, we talked about this, that we're going to get through the entire game without... A cougar. Well, we can have we people out there waiting around to see what happens. The Jags. That's right. I like the Jags. First and 15. Mick Jagger would like. From the 32-yard line. And the catch is made by Rich Griffith. Down at the 25-yard line. Pickup of seven. Sam Mills makes the tackle. Sam Mills. What a great player he's been over the years. And, of course... Been a steady player for so long for New Orleans. Comes in now and takes over and is the leader of this team. He's a little man, 5'9", 232 pounds, but works perhaps harder than anyone in this league. And a tremendous football intellect and, and Dom Capers yesterday admitting that there are things that we on the coaching staff don't see that Sam points out to us. And on second and eight, the oh, pass intended flag. for Desmond Howard and Rod Smith again coming in, and we've got a flag. No question, he made contact before the ball was there. I'll tell you one thing, he made contact. There was a hit. Second pass interference call against the Panthers. They had a completion on this earlier. They come back to it. Howard with a couple of steps, drive to the inside, and here's the contact before the ball is there. Yeah. No question about it. It'll yes. be first down inside the 20. What's well, the second call against the Panthers? It's the second one against Rod Smith. He's uh, he's corralled both of the interference calls against Carolina. Howard and Smith have seen each other before when Desmond was playing at Michigan. Rod was playing corner for Notre Dame. 
And uh, remember the tremendous Whoa, catch that Desmond Howard made to win that game for Michigan his senior year. I wonder if that was against Smith. Uh, that I do not know. From the 18-yard line, Orlein takes off and slides to a stop at the 9-yard line. So Steve improvises for a good game. It'll be second and short. Burline again with all the skills to make it a big time. He had big games for the Raiders. He had big games for Dallas. He had big games for Arizona. And then he got Ryan Eyes last year and and he was gone. Well he's been he's been Davis-sized and Ryan sized. Mm -hmm. This guy has run afoul of both Buddy Ryan and Al Davis. And everybody uh, uh, you know, Steve well, Burline's a great guy. Of. How did he get in both of their colossal doghouses? That is some exacta. Second down and two at the 10-yard line. Swinging to the outside is Stewart, and a nice play by Gerald Williams breaking through from the nose to take him down for a four-yard loss. Capers knows all about a guy like Gerald Williams and Don playing that 3-4. And interestingly, of the 30 teams in the league, Carolina is one of only three to play a 3-4 this year. And it is the same defensive scheme that, that he employed as coordinator of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Asking him yesterday, could uh, Greg Lloyd or, or any of your other guys walk right in here and play? And he said, absolutely. It's the exact same terminology. Third and five, only Pittsburgh, New England, and Carolina will play the 3-4 this year as their base defense. Berlin on third and five, stays in the pocket, then guns it, and it's picked off at the two-yard line by Tim McHire. And McHire brings it back out to the 26-yard line. Oh, Berline's thrown right into his own. McHire just laying off, reading Berline. Easy interception for McHire. McHire just playing kind of a free safety. Steps in front of it. Intended for Givens, and McHire with a good return. Good play for Carolina. The much-traveled Tim McHire coming up with a big play here in the first quarter. He has played for, we're talking about Burline playing for a lot of different coaches and the combination that he has seen. Burline throwing the interception there into the arms of McHire as they check out the clock here. The clock now showing 125 to go in the first quarter. When you talk about uh, McHire, though, with uh, Dom capers and he will tell you that he is a quality cornerback and a cornerback that he wants on his football team and he should know because he had him last year with the Steelers brought him to the Carolinas his sixth team yeah, so obviously Carolina. Dom doesn't hold a grudge uh, you know we mentioned the, uh, you know that, that, that Tim was victimized in uh, in the AFC championship game <laughs> From the 26-yard line, here's Barry Foster, another ex-stealer, losing two as the Jacksonville defense springs it out. Luganius making the tackle. Talking about McIntyre, sixth team, and it's his fourth different team in four years. So we told you about our preseason schedule. Our regular season of Monday Night Football starts Labor Day night, Monday night, September 4th, back at the 9 o'clock Eastern time start. The Dallas Cowboys against the New York Giants. Well, the Giants talking big. Dan Reeves coming right out and saying, you know, he'd be disappointed if they didn't finish in the playoffs with 11 and 5. That's pretty big time talk. Pretty streaky ball club last year. Mm -hmm. They're a better ball club yeah. this year. On second and 12, the pass is complete. That's Don Beebe making the catch right to Beebe, as was the case a number of times through the years in Buffalo on a first down. Giants last year either won a lot in a row or lost a lot in a row. That's well, as they say, I've had that seven-game losing streak that have been undefeated. Opened up with, uh, what, four straight Four wins, straight. Seven and down and then five up at the that's end. That's right. That is streaky. Right. 50% thus far for 34 yards. 21 seconds remaining in the quarter. Foster on a draw. Finds a little room to the outside. Barry works his way up to the 44-yard line. Goganius, the middle linebacker, again in on the tackle. It'll be second and five as the clock ticks down to the end of a historic first quarter. 
for the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Carolina Panthers. A 66-yard punt return by Desmond Howard accounting for the scoring. End of one. It is Jacksonville 7, Carolina nothing. He was perhaps the greatest running back the game has ever known. And on the day he set the NFL's all-time rushing record, his uniform was sent to the Hall of Fame. His own arrival was only a matter of time. Hi, I'm Walter Payton. My induction into Pro Football's Hall of Fame is an honor that will always be special to me. But that honor was made even more special because my son Jared presented me for enshrinement, something that no other son has done for his father. Your friends and your fans, I say congratulations too. We're both thrilled with the hall itself. The treasure chest of football history with this regal enshrinement gallery, its action theater, its authentic mementos and exhibitions. From 100 years of pro football, the hall does more than celebrate the game I love. It lets the future touch the past. The Hall of Fame, where legends never die and the season never ends. This message furnished by the National Football League. The AFC-NFC Hall of Fame game on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by calcium-rich Tums. Tums helps wipe out heartburn and gives you calcium. As we start the second quarter, a look at Kerry Collins. We'll see him later, the fifth man picked in the draft, the quarterback from Penn State, and the quarterback of the future, they hope for the Panthers to begin the second quarter trailing seven to nothing to Jacksonville second and five and Barry Foster trips as he gets started no gain Goganius in again on a play it'll be third down and five watching Kerry Collins uh, warm up before this game I, I thought to myself if he doesn't make it a quarterback they could play him at any one of about six different <laughs> positions the kid is six five and a legitimate 240 pounds that is a, a big quarterback. It's a big <laughs> anything. Look at him standing. That's Jerry Colquitt, another uh, quarterback there to his left, number seven, who's 6'4", 208. Look at him, power over. This is Christian on a draw, picks up the first down, gets into Ooh. Jacksonville territory, wrestled down by Darren Carrington at the 39-yard line. 18-yard pickup for the former Chicago Bear. His third team, he started with Atlanta. Round up at Chicago, came here in the expansion draft. Never been on a football team that everybody associated with that club just didn't love the kid. Great special teams player, good blocker. This is a rare opportunity to really get out and show him something running the football. Just always seems to end up being a number game that, uh, that cost Bobby Christian, but uh, uh, he was exposed in the expansion draft and uh, Carolina was more than happy to take him. I don't think Dave wants that, wanted to lose him. Right, incomplete, goes Christian's way again. We're going to see Reich in the first half, and then Collins will play the third quarter, and Jack Trudeau will play the fourth quarter. There's a, a fellow we haven't mentioned yet today. Everybody assuming Reich is going to be the starter, and it figures that he will, but Jack Trudeau with a very impressive uh, training camp and preseason, if he has one, could make it uh, an interesting choice for Dom Capers. You take away his injuries, Jack Trudeau over the years with Indianapolis had some, some sir, really good games, uh, good years. Had a couple of problems, knee and shoulder. Foster. And he picks up about four. Capers telling us don't read anything into this rotation. Our next preseason game, Jack Trudeau will get the whole first half, and it'll be Frank Reich that'll go in and play the fourth quarter. We're going to continue to use Kerry Collins as our third quarter quarterback, but don't read anything into this. The first half today belongs to Frank Reich, but the first half coming up, and they play again on Friday, do they not? At Chicago. Right, that will be Jack Trudeau's half. And their season opener is September 3rd at Atlanta. Jacksonville opens at home in the regular season against Houston. On third and six, right throws, and it's almost picked off. Intended for BB. Good coverage on the play, though. It's Benny Clark, ex Saint and Falcon, with the coverage. Well, we talked about earlier that Benny Clark is a very good underneath man with man for man coverage. He can't handle the speed too, too well, but he is a very smart 
cornerback. He gets a read of the eyes of the quarterback, steps right in front of Beebe, and well, almost picked that off. If you went back and played that in really slow motion, I think you'd see that Clark made his break before Beebe. I don't know what his read was, but it tipped him off before Don Beebe even broke. 51-yard field goal attempt by John Casey is no good. Appeared to have the distance, but it was wide to the right, well wide to the right. And so Carolina is still scoreless with 12.48 to go in the half. The Jaguars will get the ball back, and they lead 7-0. That's tonight here on ABC. Time well spent begins the evening, and then Kirk Cameron and Dean Jones star in the new version of a Disney classic, The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes. Then tomorrow, America's Funniest Home Videos, The Adventures of Lois and Clark, per usual on Sunday night, and An Inconvenient Woman, best on the best-selling novel. That's tomorrow night right here on ABC. Mark Brunel comes in to play quarterback now for the Jaguars. Brunel was acquired from the Green Bay Packers in a draft day trade to back up Steve Berline. And who knows what's going to happen to, to Mark as he develops. I talked to Tom Coughlin yesterday about his hopes for Brunel, and he certainly hopes that he'll be more than a backup quarterback through the years. I believe his quote was, we want him to be the man. Mm -hmm. And so he comes in here from the 42-yard line, and the lefty goes right to the air, but everybody's covered, so he takes off and picks up about four yards before he is stopped by Sam Mills. Brunel originally a fifth-round draft pick at Green Bay in 93, and the Jacksonville traded a third and a fifth to pick him up. 12 of 27 in the two years he was at Green Bay, of course, playing behind Brett Favre. And really, Tom Coughlin said it was the key to our entire draft day. They make this, they made the trade the day before the draft, and it, it really then allowed them to, they go ahead and kept number two, took Baselli. Uh, unfortunately, he's hurt out six to eight weeks, but he said it was the key to our entire draft day thinking was Grinnell prior to the draft. On second down and five, with protection, throws over the middle, and the pass is incomplete. Contact made as Derek Brown was the intended receiver. And he was covered well by Brett Maxey, a couple of veterans. That's Kevin good. Gilbride, the former Oiler offensive coordinator, now calling the shots here. Uh, you mentioned Brett Maxey earlier, Al, being a veteran, along with Bubba McDowell, both of them coming uh, over as veteran players, but both of them also coming off of injuries. Good play there by Maxey. McDowell coming in for also a seven-year veteran. He's coming in for Miami. Third and five. Going, Brunel almost slipped and then throws and it's caught at the 47 yard line that's going to be a first down he threaded it to Ernest Gibbons after a lot of very productive years with Houston quite bitter about being cast adrift by the Oilers and Ernest very much looking forward to Jacksonville's first regular season game when they face the Houston Oilers and so is Kevin Gilbride and you yes <laughs> and you looked at that graphic that showed you Ernest's numbers uh, of 542 career receptions this is a guy this is a guy who's posting Hall of Fame type numbers and uh, I think it surprises a lot of people from the 46 yard line and they're gonna let him throw it well he may make the Hall of Fame as a catcher, but not as a pitcher. <laughs> <laughs> they call it a receiver in this game. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> you know, now that you're flip-flopping on a weekly basis here. <laughs> I am not Tim, and this is not Jim. <laughs> this is Dan and Frank. Look at that, 542 career receptions. And Kellen Winslow, who was inducted into the Hall today, you, granted he was a tight end, but uh, impressive stuff being posted by Ernest Gibbons. He's caught as many passes as Lance Allworth did in his career, and Stewart gets taken down by Rod Smith, and there is a marker down. I think you have to also equate those pass receptions, not that he's not a great receiver, with the offense he played in. The Houston offense is a little different than one Lance Allworth played in, and or maybe, maybe not much different than Kellen Winslow and no, there's no, Dan Faust, but I no, there's no question, question about the Houston offense being... Let's put it in the air. When you play the run and shoot and you're a receiver and you can stay healthy and 
you know, the, the seasons are longer now, no doubt. But uh, Ernest Givens, uh, give him his due. We're not a big guy, 5'10", 181. He's, he's caught a lot of run, balls and held second, together. Number 50 on the offense. 10 yards, still second down. Tom Myslinski. Whistled for the infraction. Kenny Wolf, our producer. Craig Janoff, our director. The crack crew misses nothing. There it is at the top of our screen. That's a trip and a leg whip. That's really more of a classic leg whip. And that hurts. <laughs> that hurts the other guy a lot. It's a dangerous move. Uh, you're really just trying to hit the guy with anything you have left. And you're in a bad position. And you leg whip the guy. And Ms. Myslansky got caught. Second and 20 now for the Jaguars from the 43. Jacksonville leading 7 to nothing, And through the middle, losing the ball is Stewart. And the Panthers recover. So the rookie from Tennessee, James Stewart, pops it up. Steve Lofton, the defensive back, fourth year out of Texas A&M, well, with off. the recovery. It bounced off a couple of people in there before Steve Lofton finally came up with it. Somebody pops it out. Sam Mills. That's downtown Canton. Take it, Dan. Well, Dan's, Dan took his headset off. I knew, I knew he was going to uh, let me. I'll tell you, there were 50,000. What so do you want to know? Crawling you know give us the, the tour. Downtown Canton, your hometown. Where yeah, there's the downtown. Uh, at Market, uh, Cleveland Avenue, running north and south. Tuscarawas running where's east and west. Where's the parade route today? Route 30. Route, it would be right running from the lower left of your screen up to the upper right of your screen, up through. But it starts in downtown and works its way north out of downtown. I got up early this morning, went down and watched it. It is really something. Oh, hey, this is a town that swells to three or four times its normal size for this uh, for the parade. They come from all over the Midwest. Now Carolina has the ball right to Christian, who makes a juggling catch and then pays the price, gets hit after a three-yard pickup at the 45-yard line. Bobby Christian uh, playing a big part in the Carolina offense to this point in the game. Hit by Roderick. Green. Good concentration, oh, keeping control of it. He knew he was going to get hit. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be second down and seven. We have 10 22 remaining in the first half. If you're just joining us, Jacksonville in white against Carolina. That have distinguished these teams. First ever outing for each. Jacksonville leading seven to nothing. And it is incomplete. Into and out of the hands of Mark Carrier, covered by Al Jackson, who says, nope, incomplete. Might point out that we're going to be talking to Steve Largent, Leroy Selman, Kellen Winslow, uh, newest members of the Hall of Fame, and of course they'll be joining us in the booth, and at halftime we'll take a look at the induction ceremonies that were just prior to kickoff. Al Jackson making the play over on the right side. Jackson from the expansion draft to Philadelphia. Third down and six now at the 45-yard line. Frank Wright, the long time back up to Jim Kelly in Buffalo. Throws. Christian makes the catch. And Bobby picks up a first down, taking it to the 31-yard line. Dave Thomas put the pressure on Reich, but he got it away, and then Christian makes the catch and picks up another Panther first down. You touched on it earlier, Dan. Christian is the type of football player you want on your football team. He'll play on special teams. He'll catch the ball. He'll run the football. But he is always the kind of guy that's going to look great in preseason because he's ready to play the minute he puts it on. Oh, this guy was ready to play when he was in uh, the eighth grade. Uh, you're right. That's just that type of kid. Foster takes it to the 29-yard line. That exhibition match is over in Atlantic City. Monica Sellis uh, in her return to tennis. 6-1, 6-3. She defeats Martina Navratilova. 6-3, 6-2, actually, the uh, official results of the two sets. So uh, great to see Monica Sellis returning to the sport after a two-year absence. Aren't you gracious now that it's over? <laughs> we report everything. Second down and seven. End around. PB. And he picks up a first down before he's forced out of bounds at the 17-yard line. This is a good sustained drive here being put on by Carolina. 
The hardest thing to do is to develop an offensive timing. Imagine how difficult that has to be for an expansion team. And this is this is a pretty impressive drive. We are about eight minutes and 40 seconds here left in the second quarter. Offensive coordinator yep. Joe Pendry, high above Pendry, coming over from the Bears. And, and really, neither team has done a lot moving the football. The only touchdown of the game has been that punt return by Desmond Howard for Jacksonville. From the 17, the fake to Foster, and then Reich lost one into the arms of Christian. And Bobby Christian is in, in for the touchdown. The signal coming late. There is a flag down, however. A marker is down. So we'll find out in a second whether it is indeed the first touchdown in Panther history, and it appears it is not. Red Cashin. Well, it was and it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, Whoa, and it is. Against Jacksonville. <laughs> it was, it was, and it is. Face mask, number 96 on the defense. That penalty is declined. Touchdown. Well, there it is. Carolina gets their first touchdown. Great effort by Bob Christian. And kind of uh, justice being served here for Christian. He has really labored away on this drive. Not well defended by Jacksonville. Those guys were late to close and a nice job stretching the ball out and breaking the plane by Bob Christian. In Bobby's three years with the Chicago Bears, total touchdowns in his career, none. But he's getting well, immortalized here as the extra point by John Casey is good after the Jacksonville fumble. Carolina catches in, 8-13 to go in the first half. The game tied at 7. Steve Largent when we come back. The Minnesota Vikings head west to tackle the AFC champion San Diego Chargers. It's an NFL preseason special, Monday, August 7th on ABC. We're back. The score is tied 7-7, and Steve Largent was enshrined today in the Hall of Fame, the great Seattle Seahawk wide receiver. Steve, in 1976, you're drafted by Houston. You're cut in training camp as you're driving back to Oklahoma. How far away was the Hall of Fame for you 19 years ago? Well, you talk about the rags to riches, uh, outhouse to the penthouse story. I think my story is uh, typifies that. It was a great day. Uh, attracted the Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, here to see you go in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, uh, that had to be kind of uh, It really was. I mean, as it. you know, his schedule is unbelievable. And he actually asked me if uh, I didn't think it was a distraction. He would really love to be here and, uh, and witness this honor. It's really nice. Do you remember your first game as a rookie, Steve? I, I do remember my first game as a rookie. Do you remember who it was against? It was against the Kansas City Chiefs. I was with the Houston Oilers. But and our first regular season game was against the Kingdom. first regular Kingdome. season game That's right. was in the Kingdom against the Cardinals and we almost lose. I think it's like 30-24. to 30-28. And we can't figure out who is this left-handed quarterback playing pitch and catch suit going up and down the field, and we didn't know we were seeing the birth of Jim Zorn and Steve Largent. What a combination. Scared us to death. <laughs> Kickoff here is uh, fumbled out of the end zone for a touchback by Jimmy Smith. And they'll take it to the 20-yard line. Well, for you, I mean, it's, it's ironic how it works out. You go into the Hall of Fame having played with an expansion team, and two teams make their debuts today. What, what do you remember about the Seattle Seahawks as they began things? Well, Al, not only that, but the uh, other expansion team that year was Tampa Bay, and, of course, Leroy Selman is another inductee sure. today. So uh, it's pretty ironic now to watch the two new expansion teams. But uh, it was a, a wild and crazy ride the first few years in Seattle. As Dan said, you never knew which team no. was going to show up. We could show up and challenge an established team like St. Louis and we could lose 60 to nothing the next week. Can you equate, equate anything with your new job as a freshman congressman to uh, the game of football? Well, I think that there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, parallels actually, but the most important parallel I think is that uh, I've learned quickly in Washington, D.C., nobody accomplishes anything single-handedly. It still comes with teamwork. Right. And uh, that ability to work as a team player and uh, uh, offer your humility and services at the same time, uh, that's how you accomplish things in, uh, in, in politics as well. Of course, it doesn't uh, hurt if you have a great offensive line <laughs> to <laughs> protect your speaker. That's I'm exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly <laughs> right. Randy Jordan just picked up three on the uh, first play in this series at second down and seven, and Brunel hands the ball to Jordan again. 
who fights his way close to a first down. When did you first begin to think about possibly running for office, Steve? I think uh, it was it was almost just over a year ago, Al, and uh, I, I guess I got to the point where I was genuinely concerned about uh, the future of my children, the direction our country was headed in, and, and decided to throw my name in the in the hat and, and run for office. Mm -hmm. And right a big victory. A yeah, right yeah, out of the was, blocks. It's been a very good year. Went in, uh, elected in November into uh, Congress and then in January to the Hall of Fame. And people ask me now, what are you going to do next year? I don't know. And also your first year of eligibility. That's uh, that's impressive. Yeah, it really is. But not surprising. No, but not, not at surprising. All. Congratulations, Steve. Yeah. Thank thanks you, for, Thanks right. for the visit. God Steve, bless. Right. Love Thank watching you, you play. Congratulations. Thanks, Appreciate it. Steve Largent, enshrined today in the Hall of Fame as... Ernest Gibbons, uh, a guy with, uh, as we said before, numbers that are approaching Hall of Fame status made the last catch. And it will be second down and three from the 37-yard line. The Jacksonville Jaguars and Carolina Panthers tied at seven with 6.25 to go in the first half. And Jordan again takes it up to the 39-yard line. So Randy Jordan, second year out of North Carolina. We saw Reggie Cobb start the game, but he came out. He was hurt early on. James Stewart spelled him, and now they take a look at number 23, Jordan. I think it's standing alongside Steve Largent. You look at the receivers today. The only one I think is comparable in the game today it would be a Don Beebe. Uh, they look like choir boys uh, playing in a big boys game. Although Steve Largent didn't have Beebe's speed. Beebe's, no. you know, Beebe is deceptively fast. Uh, just what a grinder. <laughs> what can I say? You're talking about a guy that if the ball was near him, he just sucked it up. He and just up. caught every one. Rich Griffith catches this one over the middle on a third and two to cross the 50 and give the Jags a first down. And what do they say in baseball? You know, the difference between being a great player is just getting that one seeing eye single every now and then. We know that with Steve Largent, he just didn't have any dropped passes. If, if, if it was close to him, he caught it. You know, you look at other receivers and, you know, what kind of numbers do they have if over the a 10 or 12 year career, the 60 or 70 or 80 balls that they dropped, if you add those numbers in, maybe they're, you know, they're, they're in a lot better position. Largent never dropped a pass. You'll the guy see, was awesome. You'll see some of them in halftime. We'll take a look at him in action. Brunel off the play fake. Great protection. Finds the open man over the middle, and that is Randy Jordan, and a marker goes down at the... Well, behind the line of scrimmage oh, as a, Lamar Lathan on a late hit of Brunel. That was a gets very late Protected flag. and flagged. Lathan is playing that left side for his coach, Dom Capers. Luck of the passer, number 57 on the defense, 15 yards, touchdown! Well, Lamar Lathan is no stranger. Here's the end of the play. This is a. This also could have been flagged for a, a late hit at the end of the play as Mike Fox comes in and buries his helmet into Randy Jordan, the running back. We had the one called back upfield against the quarterback, against Lamar Lathan, no stranger to hitting quarterbacks. He's made a career out of punishing these guys. He's an exceptional athlete. Comes off the corner with blinding speed. Sort of a Kevin Green for Adam Capers. Yeah. Uh, he'll be playing. Capers has to make a decision. Can I play him at linebacker and involve him in pass coverage at all? That's always been Lamar Lathan's problem. He's a tremendous pass rusher, but at times if he's got to go back into coverage, he can be a liability. When Houston took took him out of the University of Houston, they tried him at linebacker, and then they finally moved him to defensive end. Uh, Dom Capers has taken him back to the power linebacking spot, if you will, and they'll use him as a linebacker, but also as a pass rusher a la Kevin Green. Second and six now for the Jacksonville Jaguars at the 22. The game tied 7-7, 4.20 to go in the first half in Canton, Ohio. Mark Brunel throws off his back foot, has it picked off, intercepted by Tyrone Poole, one of the Panthers' number one draft choices. And Tyrone Poole from Fort Valley State takes it all the way into the end zone for a touchdown. Paul Butcher came on the blitz. Paul Butcher, the middle linebacker, untouched coming up the middle, and that's the reason there's an interception return for a touchdown. Yeah, but Tyrone Poole, we talked yep. about him earlier. He is the kind of football player in training camp that has been around every big play. He's been making the play, making something happen. It happens again for Tyrone Poole. 
Right there, see Butcher number 53. He hurries the throw. Brunel throws off his back foot. The pass floats on him. And then Tyrone Poole does his thing. Poole had to jump for that. Yeah. He's only 5'8". Ordinary defensive back. He'd have been taking it in stride. 85 yards for Tyrone Poole. John Casey, the former Seahawk, who got a big contract to move to Carolina to be the free agent place kicker out of the hold of Tommy Barnhart boots it through and the Panthers have their first ever lead 14-7 with 3.59 to go in the half what a shot <laughs> next Saturday night baseball night in America check your local listings for the game in your area and then Monday night we will be in San Diego a week from this Monday. Jack Murphy Stadium is the site. The game starts at 8 o'clock Eastern Time and 5 Pacific. The Vikings against San Diego. Monday, August 14th, we go to Cleveland where the Browns host the Chicago Bears. And then on Monday, August 21st, we'll be at Mile High Stadium where the Denver Broncos will be hosting the Dallas Cowboys. And then our regular season opener, Labor Day night when Dallas faces the Giants at the Meadowlands. Great day for a lot of kids in northeastern Ohio as the big boys come to, to their city. Hall of Fame festivities all week long. And the culmination of this game today, the debuts of the Jaguars and the Panthers. Carolina leading by seven. And the kick is taken at the six-yard line. It's John Morton who brings it back out to the 24-yard line. Well, as in boxing, the tail of the tape here, you can take a look at the uh, players who have been regulars in the NFL at one point or another. Carolina with two dozen of them in Jacksonville, 16, who in 1994 were regulars. Carolina with a total of 12. Jacksonville with 10 guys who were regulars last year. Barry Foster has rushed for over 1,000 yards in his career, as has Reggie Cobb. And each team has a man who has caught passes totaling 1,000 yards in a season in his career. The NFL rules will apply for this fight. Scoring will be on the six-point must system per touchdown. Only the referee can stop the fight, and that referee today is Red Cash. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what do you think, Alex? Su succeeding Arthur McCanty <laughs> as James Stewart carries for a gain of a couple. Sunny, warm day here, but it's not humid. Not bad at all. It's... Uh, and we think of other days when we have been here in Canton, Ohio. Of course, this has been part of the Monday Night Package since 1970. We've seen just about everything here. And a nice view. The first time, as we said, that the uh, Goodyear blimp has been in use for this game. And the, the blimp is moored uh, nearby in Akron. Second down and nine. And pressure, but Brunel escapes. Mark with some niftiness a la Steve Young uh, who wears that same number Sam Mills pressured him and Brunel out of, able to get out of the pocket and come close to picking up a first down by God they're both left-handed too yeah. aren't they mm -hmm. uh, what a only the bank accounts different fast Big time fast <laughs> just just a couple of zeros real fine moves that's to get away from Sam Mills mm -hmm. you've got to get low to make Sam go over the top of you <laughs> Sam at 5'9", the shortest linebacker in the league. Pretty niftiness, uh, pretty nifty there by uh, Mark Brunel. He can go, trying to atone for that poorly thrown pass that was returned for a touchdown by Tyrone Poole. And on third and one, James Stewart, who has a uh, number one draft choice, the much heralded one. They hope to have him in the starting lineup on opening day. Really hasn't gotten untracked in the first half, and he has stopped at the line of scrimmage. Well, he had some great numbers out of Tennessee, didn't he? Set an all-time rushing record there, over 3,000 yards. Or nearly 3,000 yards. Comes up short here. It's going to be fourth down. Played behind uh, Charlie Garner uh, there at Tennessee. Garner now with the Eagles. Yep, the I got to measure anyway here. Appears to be short. Talk about tough guys. Well, Charlie is. Garner uh, not qualifies. Not big, is he? No, he's not. This play's big. 
So they were a half yard shy of the first down with two minutes and 11 seconds to play in the opening half. And the Jaguars will punt. Jaguars will play their next game at Miami on Friday night. And then they'll open up what was the old uh, Gator Bowl and is now a, a brand new facility known as Jacksonville Municipal Stadium. On Friday, August 18th, their preseason home opener against the St. Louis Rams. Byron Barker will punt, but not until the two-minute warning has afforded us an opportunity to take this break. Back in a minute, 14-7 Carolina. Ohio. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, Dan Deardorff, Lynn Swan working the sidelines. Our preseason opener. First of four preseason games we'll have for you. And then our 26th season of Monday Night Football begins on Labor Day night. The Giants against the Cowboys. Pretty nice high school stadium, wouldn't you say? Beautiful. Home of the Canton McKinley Bulldogs. Brian Barker to punt. Two minutes to go in the half. Comes down to the 19-yard line. Vernon Turner. Looks for room to the outside. No, sir. Taken down back at the 15-yard line. Good coverage. Tom McManus makes the tackle. Well, how have expansion teams done in the past in the uh, National Football League? And you go back to Dallas and Minnesota coming in in the early 60s. Dallas in 1960 didn't win a game. Minnesota the following year came in with Tarkenton, 3-11, and, and the Falcons, Miami in 66, New Orleans in 67, and Cincinnati in 68, all in 3-11. And Seattle was 2-12 and in 76, and John McKay's Tampa Bay Bucks were winless in 76. Passes flipped out here to Duell Brewer for a minimal game. So you had two winless teams and the most victories ever for an expansion team three. Today, Carolina failed to recover a kickoff, missed a field goal. Jacksonville with two picks, one return for a touchdown, and one fumble. Up to the 23-yard line. Jacksonville just substituted an entire defensive football team between first down and second down. They weren't even into position by the time the Carolina snapped the ball. <laughs> and, and then lock him, and it jumps offside here. But that is change. You know, they had a timeout. It'll be a 40-second timeout. But they had a timeout before. They could have substituted them, but they waited to left that first play. So Reich heading over to discuss things on the sidelines. At the 23-yard line with 102. They have now put their first team back in here for the end of the first half. First team defensive unit. 24,625. They've just announced the crowd today and with the uh, added seats, a new record for this game. Well, this entire... And this game is just really the culmination of an entire week. There is a good look at that. That entire section right there is all brand new. Just put in for this game. There's another smaller section kind of diagonally across uh, the field. But this game is just the culmination of a week long period of festivities here in Canton, Ohio. Fashion shows, luncheons, breakfast, offside. <laughs> yep, offside. 20 of those third and five. Pass up to the 28-yard uh, line, uh, but Kelvin Pritchett came across the line. Red connection <laughs> with the call here. That's the shadow of the flip, flip hovering overhead, yeah. crossing the field. Red Cashin disappearing for a moment. Offside against the Jaguars. There it goes the blimp, shadow. You made a lot of those affairs, I understand, Dan. Yes, I, I was a big hit at the fashion shows. Mm -hmm. 
You were at the uh, mayor's breakfast yesterday morning where you got the Pete Roselle Award, Frank, by the way. Congratulations. Congratulations for your, your excellence in the world of broadcasting over low these few years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 25 on Monday night, I can tell Defense. you that. <laughs> Five yards. And, and you weren't a rookie when you started on Monday night either. <laughs> and I was proud to receive it just because of the name on it, Pete well. Roselle, and it will be in the Hall of Fame. And I wish Pete and Kerry well. They could be here. But both of them doing fine, and we'll be out to see them next week in San Diego. It is first and ten at the 28-yard line. As Eddie Fuller, one-time Buffalo Bill, picks up a yard up to the 29-yard line. Either the blimp is casting a very large yeah. shadow right now, or for the first time this game, the sun is gone. Meanwhile, the clock <laughs> the clock wasn't moving, and it's not moving for whatever reason, and we can only hope they're keeping the time on the field. Otherwise, time is standing still here in Canton. <laughs> Maybe that's why the sun went. Well, now it's running. <laughs> no, we got it backwards. It's supposed to run during the play. <laughs> Will the timer please put 30 seconds on the clock? <laughs> 30 seconds. That's a good guess. Red is Three, a... zero. <laughs> Red is a patient man, but I think we're beginning to see him fraying around the edges a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, this trouble started before the kickoff. Yeah. Well, we don't, we don't have a play clock. We haven't had that uh, since the beginning of the game that tracks whether there's 40 or 25 seconds for a team to execute a play. There it sits. Uh, <laughs> Locked permanently on zero. So it's third down and eight now at the 30-yard line. The Panthers try to convert and do on a 10-yard catch by Metzelar is up at the 40-yard line, and that is a first down, and we will assume there are 21 seconds remaining in the first half. Well, coming up at halftime, per usual on this, our opening telecast of the season, the induction ceremony, which took place beginning at 11 o'clock local time this morning. We had a chance, uh, of course, earlier to visit with Steve Largent, and in the second half, we will have a chance to uh, visit with Leroy Selman and with Kellen Winslow, who will be making their way in here. And the uh, two men, of course, were posthumously enshrined today. The late Jim Finks, uh, a player for seven years with the Pittsburgh Steelers mainly, but uh, made his mark as an executive through the years with the Bears and the Vikings and the Saints. And uh, the late Henry Jordan of the Green Bay Packers, the tremendous defensive tackle who, uh, despite being in great shape, uh, died years ago at the age of 42 of a heart attack. His son here today to accept that honor. The irony of Henry Jordan, uh, he arrived in Green Bay the same year Vince Lombardi did. Played all through those championship seasons. On first down now, right under pressure and gets taken down back at the 37-yard line by Ernie Logan. Well, they're just guessing how much time is left yeah. here. Well, no, now we'll start it. Well, they, they stop it after a sack just to reset mm -hmm. the ball, and then they, they automatically hand wind it on the signal from the official. Well, but, but this is going back and forth. Now it's all zeros, and we'll see if they mean it. There it is. <laughs> we, we assume that's the end of the first half, and, and it is. Officially. So the end of the first half, two brand new teams debuting today in Canton, Ohio, and at the half, it's the Carolina Panthers, 14, the Jacksonville Jaguars, 7. The Spirit of the North State, KRCR-TV. The Toyota Halftime Report, brought to you by Toyota and their full line of quality cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. Here now, Frank Gifford. 
Canton, Ohio, the Hall of Fame game, first ever game for Carolina in Jacksonville, and Carolina leads at the half 14 to 7. And earlier today, just prior to kickoff, the five newest members of the NFL's Hall of Fame were formally inducted into the Hall. A superb class, here they are. Today, the Hall of Fame honors the memory of another member of the great Packer dynasty of the 60s, Henry Jordan. Coming to Green Bay in a trade with the Cleveland Browns, this incredibly quick defensive tackle became a mainstay in a defense that helped the Pack win five NFL championships and two Super Bowls. A six-time All-NFL selection and four-time Pro Bowler, Henry came to the Pack the same year as Vince Lombardi. Together, they developed into Packer legends who now are side-by-side -side in the Hall of Fame. Henry Jordan, a quiet, considerate gentleman off the field, passed away in 1977. Today, he not only joins his coach, but 10 of his former teammates, as his son Henry Jr. accepts his dad's induction into the Hall of Fame. I miss you very much, and I wish you were here to celebrate this day together, but I know you can hear me. You are the best. Be content to know that your style and techniques of play have laid the foundation for and inspired many of the great athletes that have followed you. You are the top in your field. Revel in it. The Hall of Fame is where you belong. I love you, Dad. You're my hero. Congratulations, you've earned it. As we honor the memory of Jim Finks with induction into the Hall of Fame, we can look back at a storied career. This strong arm quarterback out of Tulsa had a Pro Bowl career that lasted until 1955 when he set out on his true calling, becoming one of the great administrators in NFL history. In 1964, Jim joined the Minnesota Vikings. Winners of only 10 games in their first three seasons, Jim brought in Coach Bud Grant and surrounded him with personnel that would lead to 11 divisional titles and four Super Bowl appearances. As GM of the Bears, Jim built a team that won a title for the first time in 14 years and then put together the Chicago team that won Super Bowl 20. His last stop was New Orleans, a team without a winning season in its 19-year history. There, Jim brought in Jim Mora, and just one year later, in 1987, the Saints beat the Steelers to assure them of their first winning season. A two-time NFL Executive of the Year, Jim passed away from cancer last year, and today, we celebrate his memory as his son Jim Jr. accepts his induction into the Hall of Fame. To sum up what Jim Finks was all about, he kept these words written on a piece of paper in his wallet at all times. If we are ever unlucky enough to have it made, then we will be spectators and not participants in life. It's the journey, not the arrival, that counts. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Jim Finks was known as a former Steeler, Viking, and Bear, but it's no coincidence he left this world a saint. Steve Largent was the 117th player taken in the 1976 draft. He was cut by the Oilers, described as too small and too slow. But he hooked up with the Seattle Seahawks in their first year for a 14-season, 200-game career. And on retirement, he held six major career receiving records, was twice an All-Pro, and played in seven Pro Bowls. Steve becomes the first Seattle Seahawk to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. The same hard work and dedication he displayed as an athlete has carried Steve to our nation's capital. As a freshman congressman from Oklahoma, Steve is a member of the Budget Committee serving on the Health Care Task Force. Commuting home to Tulsa to spend time with his family is usually coupled with speeches, work on the many charities in which he is involved, and visits to area schools. Today, Steve Largent joins the Hall of Fame in his very first year of eligibility. My faith is not a system of belief, not a code of honor, but a relationship with Jesus Christ, who provided his love in a lonely death. I could explore God's grace to me forever and never reach its depth and never find its limits. His blessing is the ultimate explanation 
for whatever is praiseworthy in my career and in my life. In football, I found temporary achievements and lasting relationships. It tested and shaped my character. I've seen the glory of this game. To be here in this place at this moment for this reason is an honor beyond all my expectations. I owe you my deepest thanks. Thank you. As a defensive end, Leroy Selman spent his entire career with the Tampa Bay Bucks, a career with many firsts. He was their first ever draft choice in 1976 and immediately established himself as one of the premier defensive players in the game. He became the first Buck to garner all NFC honors in 1978. He was in six straight Pro Bowls and in 1979 was the NFL's Defensive Player of the Year. Athletics are still a large part of Leroy's life. At the University of South Florida, Leroy is the Associate Director of Athletics. And today, he becomes the first Buck ever to enter the Hall of Fame. I also would like to thank the fans throughout the years that supported me and you follow Oklahoma to the University of Oklahoma and right in the Tampa Bay. Uh, without that support of not only myself but all those teams and the, and the game of intercollegiate football and the professional football game, I wouldn't be here today as well. I'm so appreciative of someone in Tampa Bay who always put a sign in the corner of the end zone that says Leroy Salmon for the Hall of Fame. I don't know who that was but that is very special. Thank you. Appreciate it. May God bless each and every one of you. At six foot five, 250 pounds, and the speed to play wide receiver, Kellen Winslow was the epitome of the modern tight end. A key member of the San Diego offensive powerhouse, Kellen had a league-leading 89 receptions in 1980, was a three-time All-Pro, played in five Pro Bowls, and was named to the NFL's 75th anniversary team. Perhaps his defining moment came with a heroic performance in an overtime victory over Miami. It was an incredible performance by Kellen Winslow, and made even more memorable when he was helped off the field, exhausted with his performance. Kellen remains in the sports spotlight. With law degree in hand, he is joined with Lynn Elmore and Precept Sports in the field of sports management and marketing. Today, Kellen Winslow becomes just the fourth tight end in NFL history to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Today, I encourage the African American athlete to awaken and join me in accepting that challenge. To awaken and take our rightful role in society as leaders. To awaken and accept the responsibility that comes with fame and fortune. To awaken to the realities of the uncertain plight of the African American condition even as we approach the 21st century. It is now with a great deal of humility and with the full appreciation of what the game has given to me, I am pleased to take my place among the greats of a National Football League. To God be the glory. The Spirit of the North State, KRCR-TV. The AFC-NFC Hall of Fame game on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Chrysler. Form follows function. Pepsi AC Acid Controller. You can be heartburn free with new Pepsi AC. And Full View TV offering up to 350 channels. Full View TV, the satellite system with the best view. We're back at Fawcett Stadium in Canton, Ohio. Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, and Dan Deardorff with Lynn Swan as we kick off the 1995 NFL preseason. And that limp shot of Fawcett Stadium in Canton, hard by I-77 that runs from Cleveland down uh, through eastern Ohio. In fact, uh, the freeway makes its way pretty close to uh, Dom Capers, old hometown of Buffalo, Ohio, about 100 miles south of here. 
Mount Union College? Is yep. that where he went That's out? That's where he went to school. With a master's degree at Kent State. Mm -hmm. Local man. His team, the Carolina Panthers, leading 14-7, and the Panthers kick off to the Jaguars as we start the second half. David Louder puts it in the air, and it's taken at the 10-yard line by John Morton, and he brings it back out to the... 24-yard line, and let's get a report from the field and Lynn Swan. Thank you very much, Al. I talked with both coaches at halftime. Tom Coughlin was genuinely upset by the way his team was playing. He says the turnovers, the bad plays by the quarterback, he wanted to eliminate those mistakes. He felt that the offense was just not playing well together. They were not picking up the fifth man rushing, so he wants to correct those things. Dom Capers was very happy with the effort his team was making. Obviously, his defense with the two big turnovers, he was very pleased with. He said he's going to try and protect the ball more in offense, and and when Kerry Collins comes into the ball game, keep, keep things much more simple for him. Al? All right, thank you, Lynn, for the uh, Jaguars now. Steve Burline back in the game. He played much of the first half. Then we saw Brunel, now Steve again. And he hands the ball off to James Stewart, the Tennessee rookie who picks up a yard, maybe a yard and a half. And we'll take a look at the numbers through the first 30 minutes of play. And turnovers were instrumental in the score as they are in uh, most games in the NFL. And the big return by Desmond Howard, of course. Well, you can look at it right there. Next to the bottom, three turnovers leading to 14 points. It's, uh, it's that simple of a game sometimes. Turn it over, you lose. Carolina out gaining Jacksonville 143 to 110. Second down and eight. Burline stays in the pocket. Open man up at the 40-yard line is Rich Griffith. Second year tight end out of Arizona. Fred Fogey makes the tackle. 14-yard pickup. Coughlin, to say the least, but I guess you could characterize him as rather intense. He's got everything down to exact science. He's believes in doing it his way in a successful way. There's no question about that. He draws a a line around their practice field at, at training camp and calls it the concentration line. When you step across that line, it's kind of like the old, everything from this point on is 100% business. Some of his, uh, some of his ploys are, you know, you know, they liken it to, you know, these are college type things, but I have they, a line it's that highly my organized house. and that highly dedicated, Frank. I have a line around my house, but it's electrified and for my dogs. <laughs> Will that work, I wonder? You know what? I have one of those, too. The old invisible fence. James Stewart <laughs> picked up about two yards, but there's a marker down, and the penalty will be against the Jaguars. You know, Dan, I got one dog who's just so dumb, he just sits there and fries. I mean, we got to pull him up with the tail. <laughs> Doesn't Holding really work. The run. <laughs> Number 73 on the offense. Ten yards, still first down. Frank, are you telling me that you have a dog that walks on top of your electric fence and, and sits there? there. Is, is that Chablis or Chardonnay? Whoa. Chablis. It's Chablis. Whoa. Chablis. Whoa, kinky. Oh, not too smart. <laughs> Would you like a Bichon? <laughs> Deardorff would look good with a Bichon. <laughs> Walking him down the street. I know it'll be on the cover of the star next week. <laughs> you dog abuser, you. <laughs> I think we've already been covered in that area. Oh. <laughs> well, that's, that's breaking new ground. <laughs> First and 20 at the 31-yard line. Burline. And the pass into traffic is caught again by Griffith. Well, we were talking about Tom Coughlin. Coughlin yeah, really, is that what we were talking that's about? That's what we were talking about. When Coughlin was first contacted by the Jaguars, their president is a man by the name of David Selden. Wayne Weaver, the uh, the founder of the franchise, but Selden was the guy who initiated the coaching search, and he left a message for Coughlin at Boston College, and Coughlin gets the message, and it says, call David Selden at Jaguar. Coughlin thinks it's a guy trying to sell him a Jaguar. He had no idea who David Selden was, and barely knew what the Jaguars were at that point. From the 37-yard line, Burline under pressure throws it out of bounds. Really kind of ironic because it wasn't there a dispute originally between the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Jaguar Motor Car Company over their logo and and if it was too close and all this and all that. But that is a funny story. I, Tom thought it was somebody trying to sell him a car. And Tom told him, I'm not interested. If I'm going to be one of five or six guys competing for the job, I'm, I'm not interested. Thanks anyway. And and uh, 
gets a call back later and says, well, how about if it's just you and one other? And, well, then he says, tell me what you've got. Mm -hmm. And uh, there he is. Boy, he's waited a long time to coach this game, though, hasn't he? And what he's got is more autonomy than most coaches in the National Football League. Third and 14. Set up a screen over the middle, which is James Stewart. And his best effort of the afternoon brings him out to the 49. Wayne Weaver is the uh, the founder of the team. That's Wayne uh, shaking uh, a hand in the back of his booth here. You're right. There are just a handful of coaches around the NFL that have the autonomy that uh, that Tom Coughlin does in, in Jacksonville that's been given to him by that guy Wayne Weaver. You know, Don Shula has it. Uh, Buddy Ryan uh, has it in, in Arizona where you are both coach and general manager. Bill Parcells has it in New England. You know, when he turned down the Giants job, I think that was a big part of the consideration. George Young, yes. a very strong influence really? there. Coughlin, uh, of course, familiar with the setup there. He knew that the Mara family was very close to George Young and it wasn't going to change. So he turned it down. Well, on fourth and two, they're going to go for it. From the 49-yard line, and James Stewart gets taken down just as he crosses midfield, and it's going to be up close enough to measure. Alan Haller makes the tackle. They'll spot it at the Panther 49-yard line, and Red Cashin takes a look, and he says, that's enough, first down. How close is George Seifert to that point with the 49ers in terms of personnel and, and if he decides that he wants this guy, is that the guy that's going to be there? Well, you know, you, you still have Carmen Policy making the ultimate decisions there but, and, and Eddie DeBartolo only the Carmen and, and then Dwight Clark has been elevated as well this year. Yeah. I just it's an interesting question as to you know, Carmen is not a football guy in a sense from a personnel standpoint. Here's Burline throwing deep and it is somehow comes up with a football. Fabulous concentration with a hand obscuring his view. Somehow able to cradle it, and he takes it in at the one-yard line. Tyrone Poole with a coverage. Yeah, Ooh, Tyrone is 5'8". Drops to his and holds on to it. If Tyrone had been 5'9", that probably would not have been a completion. A pretty good position and just mm, good concentration on the part of Smith. Good concentration at the end of the blow. Watch this. So hold on to it. Or did he? Upon further review, still a catch. After that catch by Smith, the... Jaguars have the ball at the Panther one-yard line. Panthers on top, 14 to 7. <laughs> if this were three years ago, we'd be doing a high school game, the Panthers and the, and the Jaguars. I mean, it's it's strange to try to, to put it together with the National Football League, but here they are. It's going to take a while. Yep. Which one of them will be the first to make it to Monday night? Mm -hmm. Well, we are still Cougar free. Jacksonville, uh, I was talking to David Selden before the game, the president of the team. He said, our goal is to be on Monday night in three years. I said, well, what if it takes as long as 10? He says, they may be on, but I won't be here to see it. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably right. First and goal, and Stewart vaults into the end zone for a touchdown. I think it's safe to say that a sixth-round draft choice can't jump that high. That's that's the way a number one goes up and over the top. He Take a good have, look at this. He that, may have found a niche here. Look at this. That that's that is great hurdle. We well, launched that at about the he three sure yard line. Did. Got a little help from some of the Panthers and uh, lands a good couple of yards into the end zone. Same Stewart. Scott Sisson now to try to tie the game. That is the hold of Brian Barker, and he does. 9.51 left in the third quarter. The game tied 14-14. And Leroy Selman in the booth when we come back to Canton, Ohio. Carolina and Jacksonville tied 14-14. After the Jaguar touchdown, it's Scott Sisson to kick off. And in just a moment, we'll be visiting with 
And Roy Selman as Tony Smith and Randy Baldwin are back to receive the kick. You got psycho. Baldwin from the nine. Up to the 29-yard line. We were talking to Steve Largent before about how far away the Hall of Fame must have seemed to him when he was cut by Houston before he was picked up by Seattle. And for you, Leroy, in 1976, you play for Tampa Bay. They don't win a game all year, and today you're in the Hall of Fame. Well, certainly it's uh, a lot to be thankful for to be in the National Football League Hall of Fame and to be a part of the continued history of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I'm happy to represent the team and all that we went through for those players and coaches and fans that uh, supported us to have its first player into the National Football League Hall of Fame. You know, you had such a remarkable career, Leroy. Do you ever look back and think how it would have been had you had somebody like you on the other side of the line? Maybe a couple more people like you uh, to think how uh, it would have been. By the way, I'm glad they didn't have anybody <laughs> like you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really don't think about that too much. I, 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 I'm just appreciative of the opportunity to play in the National Football League. And, you know, you go out, you're only one person. You do the very best you possibly can. You play as a team. You win and lose as a team. And, um, and you just go from there. You don't worry too much about if, if this would have been or if that would have been. And overall, it's just been a great career and uh, opportunities to go out and play uh, with a lot of great guys and uh, against a lot of great uh, guys like, like this one right here. I mean, <laughs> one of the, the best offensive linemen in the league here. You didn't need any help for him, huh? Well, Not at all. You know, Frank, your, your your point is so valid because, and I laughed because I got the other guy. I was the right tackle, and that means I didn't have to play against Leroy Selman. And it was so huge because when you went to play Tampa, it was it was the automatic. It was the way the game started, your whole game plan. Who are the two guys that we're going to have to put on Leroy Selman? Because uh, there wasn't, at that point in time, a left tackle in the game that could handle you one-on-one. -on -one. It couldn't be done. You had the best club move. Right. than I've ever seen. The, then the club is where he knocks that guy from the inside and, and don't do it now. And don't do it now. <laughs> the one you can't do it anymore. Yeah, that's Why right. Why don't you just that's do it right. to Frank, right? <laughs> <laughs> Those old days were over and everything. But uh, again, I just enjoyed the, the career and I just thank God for it most of all and my support from family and I'm glad to be here today because I have a brother that's yep. coaching in this game with the Jacksonville uh, yeah, Jaguar all... and um, look at you this know, Leroy you well, say it and he appears th there he is and uh, I'm so proud of him that uh, our whole family brothers and sisters my mom is all up here with us and uh, so we're so this is just as big of a celebration as uh, getting into the Hall of Fame as seeing him he's trying to get his outside backers to put some pressure on Kerry Collins their number one draft choice who completes a pass here to Greg Clifton for a first down and of course, the whole Selman family is here today. Dewey, who uh, who gave the speech uh, inducting you into the Hall of Fame, was he was your uh, your prom date? Is uh, <laughs> yeah, found yeah, out today, yeah. Huh? He finally told it. He was <laughs> our he was my my prom date and uh, a good one he was. And uh, certainly uh, he still is a good date. He did a good job there today. <laughs> <He did. laughs> so. Leroy, tell everybody what you're doing now. Well, currently I'm working at the University of South Florida. I'm an associate athletic director there, and uh, our athletic department is trying to grow. One of our major projects is to bring on an intercollegiate football program which I think is a great way to try to give back something that has been given to me while I was attending the University of Oklahoma which is a good education yeah, absolutely well Leroy we thank you very much sir okay we thank you congratulations Leroy I appreciate it good very you. very Real much proud of you. thank you Dan Man, well okay. deserved okay thanks Frank Terrific. Yeah, well, thank you thank you good to be here guy still good. scares me <laughs> no, not at all <laughs> this one should be in the Hall of Fame right <laughs> here I'm be. telling uh, you right now you're too nice <laughs> Leroy Selman thanks, Leroy. okay you. thank you Take First man right. picked in the 1976 draft out of Oklahoma. After the penalty, it's first and 15 now for Carolina as the snap is fumbled. Terry Collins trying to maintain possession. The fifth man picked in the draft out of Penn State, and the man they hope is the quarterback of the future. Things getting a little heated on this hot afternoon, and Matt Elliott was snapping it to Kerry Collins, and some mistiming there, but they were able to maintain possession. We'll pick up on what Dan said earlier. We took a look at Kerry Collins on the sideline. 6'5", 240 pounds. He's a big man. Number one pick, of course, and after Frank Reich had signed, Frank Reich, I think, looking for that spot to be a starter after 10 years as a backup in Buffalo, and you talk to either one of them and say no they're working together to try to make the best team they can no problems between them second and 15 here's a screen duel brewer gets it up to the 39 yard line 
Monty Groh makes the tackle with six and a half minutes to play in the third quarter. And there are the numbers for Terry Collins in his career at Penn State. He'd like to keep that three to one touchdown to interception ratio. I know that. He won't. <laughs> no, he will not. <laughs> he was a superb high school athlete. He was a great baseball player, football player. Uh, drafted, I think, uh, but he tried to win uh, baseball. So he's not just big, he's a fine athlete. Guy could be an outside linebacker. Third down and 12. I think and we only had 10 men on the field, to tell you the truth. Yep, here comes number 11 right now. <laughs> Timeout. Charge to the Panthers. Six minutes to go in the third. 14-14 is the score. Lake in northeastern Ohio. Now, how did you know not to well, call that Lake Myers? I, I'm not sure. Either way. You're right. It's Myers Lake. Myers Lake on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Uh -oh. There was a lot of movement. I don't see any flags. I do see movement, though, on Collins, who gets well, taken down hard. Well, they've got to be. And Carolina yeah. winds up with a football. Jason Simmons is the guy who crashed into him. Well, Collins... Collins almost stopped like he thought that somebody was going to stop the play. He and Matt Elliott are talking all the way off the field as center. But Carey, halfway back there, almost came to... He's looking around like... Now, it's an early snap. Early There's no snap. doubt about that. That's the center. But right about here, Collins has just go, got to go down. You, you know they're on you. Don't stand there and take that shot. Here's Ernest Givens accepting the punt from Barnhart. And he brings it back to the 50-yard line. So the Jaguars will take it there. 36-yard group, 10-yard run back. The game tied at 14, mid-third quarter. Minnesota Vikings head west to tackle the AFC champion San Diego Chargers. It's an NFL preseason special, Monday, August 7th on ABC. A reminder, tomorrow coverage of the final round of the Senior British Open from Northern Ireland. Bob Murphy is the leader going into the final day. And then coverage of the Michigan 500. Jacques Villeneuve heading the field there tomorrow. At 2:30, well, if that senior Bob open, Murphy's out. If that senior open has a finish, anything like the regular British Open, it'll be something. Andre Ware is the quarterback, and Randy Jordan is the ball carrier. He takes it to the 44. So here's another Heisman Trophy winner. We talked about Desmond Howard, but Andre really unable to to get it started in his career. And even now, he would be a long shot to make the roster. They're going to carry three quarterbacks, and Andre's going to need a good preseason to make the Jaguar roster. Detroit's first in, what, 90 and seventh pick overall last year. That by Minnesota, out of football. You saw Rob Johnson, who figures to be the number three quarterback, the rookie out of USC, as Jordan takes it again. You know they're going to go with Burline. They traded for Brunel, so now it becomes a, a, a choice of Rob Johnson, the rookie out of USC, or Andre Ware as your number three quarterback. And I think that if you know anything about the way rosters are put together, it's incumbent upon Andre Ware to really show something sparkling. He's the guy that has to impress upon this coaching staff that he's able to get it done, that he's able to play at this level. You know, I, it's, I really found it astounding that he was out of the game entirely for all of 1994. Where the, you know, the way quarterbacks get hurt and go down. On third and three, Ware throws too high. And Ware goes down in the arms of Carlton Bailey. And it will be fourth down. Willie Jackson was the intended receiver. Bailey, the former Bill and Giant. Now with his third team. And Willie Jackson uh, is a kid that's got a shot at this thing. I, I think that it's clear in Jacksonville that Desmond Howard and Ernest Givens have kind of separated themselves from the field, and they are clearly the top two receivers. Then you've got Tillman and Smith and, and the rest of that group that includes guys like Willie Jackson and... It'll be interesting to see who emerges from that. Brian Barker, the punt, Tyrone Poole, the rookie who ran an interception back, 85 yards for a touchdown in the first half. Back to receive it. And the kick bounces just outside the goal line and then hops into the end zone. 
Jaguars put him down as before. Bounces in for the touchback. After the 20, it comes. The game tied 14-14. At the 20-yard line, the Carolina Panthers will take over here. The game time, 14-14, three minutes and 42 seconds remaining in the third quarter. Those kids with the, the best seat in the house. The best price, anyway. Up on the hillside on a hot day, Canton, Ohio. Full house, capacity crowd more than 24,000 looking on as the NFL preseason gets underway. Stadium's growing and the hall is growing. Collins, the quarterback. Ooh, the handoff to Duell Brewer, and he gets pushed back by Corey Mayfield. And I mean pushed. Brewer out of Oklahoma has been look good in training camp. Very quick. 5'8, 200 pounder. It's hammered. Right now there are a lot of players that have not worked together much in scrimmage and workout or whatever. And getting the third and fourth quarter of this game, any preseason game early in the year, and you get a lot of mistakes. Second and 11, they run a draw, and not much happening there for Eddie Fuller. Frank talking about the hall expanding. They add new exhibits every year and, and new features. And this fall, people who, uh, who visit the Hall of Fame here in Cannes will be able to take a look at a 20 by 40 foot cinemascope screen provided by uh, NFL Films, and it's uh, called the 100-Yard Universe, a, uh, a brand new feature beginning this fall at the Hall of Fame. Third down and 10 at the 19-yard line. And Collins throwing deep and finds his man up at the 41-yard line, threading it into the hands of Greg Clifton for a 21-yard pickup. That was a well-thrown ball under a lot of pressure, and Collins waited and waited until Clifton uncovered. He's the big man looking downfield. Didn't get locked up on the receiver. Held it to the last second, releases it over one defender in front of another. Greg Clifton with the reception. Carolina now at its own 41-yard line on first down. And the handoff to Duell Brewer, second-year man out of Oklahoma, taken down after a minimal game. Well, Jerry Richardson, the man on the left, played with the Baltimore Colts with Johnny Unitas in the late 50s, and he was the driving force behind Carolina getting a National Football League franchise. He worked very hard for a number of years, put it all together, and there he is. And you can say he is now one of the the founding fathers in effect caught a touchdown pass against my Giants in our 1959 championship game from Johnny Unitas and then they they beat us again and second and nine they run the end around and to the 42 yard line Eric Gulliford who had one moment in the sun a couple of years back with Minnesota when he made a key catch down the stretch to provide a victory for them and now trying to win a job with the Panthers Taking it to the Jacksonville 42-yard line. That's a 16-yard pickup with a minute and three seconds remaining in the third quarter. You'd think that any type of a misdirection play like that would really work in a game like this. You've got expansion teams. Everybody's so desperately trying to impress the coach. It's, it's pretty easy to, to get that guy who's supposed to stay at home and get him going someplace else. Collins flips one out, and the catch is made by Brian O'Neill for a two-yard pickup. Taken down at the 40-yard line. Pretty good job of Chris Hudson, their rookie uh, out of Colorado, their number third choice, their third choice rather, as he drives him out of bounds. Dom Capers watching his club put together the best drive so far under young Kerry Collins. Second down, eight at the 40-yard line. Blitz, it's picked up, and the pass is dropped. And that was Gulliford at the 30-yard line. Can't hold on with four ticks left 
in the third quarter. And one that should have been caught. It was well thrown. Beautiful timing on the part of Collins. You get a good look at it for this shot. He has to deliver right here. He did right on the numbers. It should have been caught. Good delivery by Collins before the linebacker could get to it. Third down and eight. Panthers at the Jaguar 40-yard line. Frank Wright done for the day. That ball into play over the headset speaker. And on third down, they convert as Vince Merrill, a former Buffalo Bill, makes the catch and takes it to the 21-yard line. And that will end the third quarter. Through three, it's Carolina 14, Jacksonville 14. And back we come to Canton, Ohio, after this word from our ABC station. The Spirit of the North State, KRCR-TV. You're watching the AFC-NFC Hall of Fame game on ABC's Wide World of Sports. See that guy right there? That's number 70, Kevin Farkas. Just keep an eye on him. He is 6'9", came to minicamp at 385 pounds has trimmed down to somewhere in the 340s. That is a huge hunk of man right there. As we start the fourth quarter on first and 10 from the 20 yard line, a five yard pickup for Duell Brewer, who gets ridden out of bounds by Monty Grau. So the Panthers trying to retake the lead. The game is tied at 14 in the inaugural game for each franchise. One running back we're not seeing today, uh, Derek Lassick is still rehabbing and of course he was picked up from Dallas in the expansion draft and they are looking for things from him here at Carolina. He did not make the trip. Oh, were not for the acquisition of Barry Foster, there's a chance Lassa could have started the regular season. Second down and five from the 15 yard line. And Brewer picking and threading his way to the 13 yard line, setting up a third down and three. Three primetime preseason games coming your way. A week from Monday night will be in San Diego, the AFC champion Chargers in their first preseason game taking on the Minnesota Vikings. On Monday night, August 14th, the Bears will visit the Cleveland Browns. And on the 21st of August, will be in Denver where the Broncos, now under Mike Shanahan, will take on the Dallas Cowboys. Some attractive matchups coming your way and our preseason games will begin at 8 Eastern five Pacific. Regular season, nine Eastern and six Pacific per usual. Kerry Collins fires over the middle and it's incomplete at the five-yard line. He tried to jam it into Vince Marrow. And it will be fourth down and they'll try to take the lead on a field goal. Pretty good timing by the defensive back to step in front of Marrow. Mike Dumas. Now a 31-yard field goal attempt. John Casey, and we mentioned before, they spent a lot of money to pick him up from Seattle, so he'll go from kicking indoors to outdoors. They think he's one of the best in the league. And he boots this one straight through from 31 yards away to put the Panthers back up on top. 13-44 left in the fourth. Carolina leading Jacksonville by three. Saturday, baseball's best swing into action. The Indians, the Dodgers, the Orioles, and the Cardinals come out to play on Baseball Night in America next Saturday on ABC. <laughs> this is the NFL on ABC. And that is not Chardonnay, nor Chablis. <laughs> Two dogs in search of a fence. <laughs> that could be, you know, Frank... Uh, <laughs> Here comes our blip shadow right across the field again. <laughs> Carolina to kick off. They lead by three after the Casey field goal. And the kick is taken at the 18-yard line. That was Morton cutting in front of Daryl Boykin and uh, returning it out to the 26-yard line. So the Jaguars will take it at that spot. 
pretty good looking drive Kerry Collins put together there for the Carolina Panthers. Had a lot of good things. I will see if Andre Ware can make something happen here for Jacksonville. Collins had the timing pass. He had to had the zip when he needed it. Good looking drive from the 25 yard line on first down. Andre Ware. Rushed out. Nowhere to go. Taken down at the 24 yard line. Tackled there by Mark Thomas. Andre Ware, a Heisman Trophy winner, but I'll tell you, that has not been the key to success in recent years. You take a look at the some of the Heisman Trophy winners. If you go back a number of years, it used to be with O.J. Simpson, Roger Staubach, Paul Horning, Earl Campbell, Tony Dorsett. They won the Heisman Trophy in the, the 60s and 70s, but here are the six most recent winners. You have Ware, Ty Detmer out of Brigham Young has made five uh, not, no starts. He's thrown five passes. You had Desmond Howard, and we'll get back to that in a second. But the pass from Ware is incomplete as he tried to, to gun it in. It'll be third down and 11. But the others of recent vintage. Gino Toretta has not thrown an NFL pass. He won the Heisman Trophy at Miami. Charlie <laughs> Ward at Florida State plays in the NBA with the Knicks, so he didn't even opt to play in the National Football League. And the most recent, Rashawn Salam, out of Colorado, drafted by the Bears, but as of this morning, still unsigned. And if you listen to both sides, they don't appear to be very close either. Third down and 11 from the 24-yard line. Where? And it's a flag at the 28-yard line. Jordan, the intended receiver. Alan Haller, number 24, was there with the coverage. I think Alan Haller is there with the flag, too. And it is against the Panthers. Pass interference, number 24 on the defense. First down. Well, it's been a very competitive game. I think the worst thing that could have happened to either team today is we take a look at the, the pass interference again. And no pretty question obvious, about that call. Obvious right there. The worst thing would have been for one team to have gotten blown out today only because the coaches, they have their own agendas and you want to stay focused on what you want to do, but you would have heard some murmurings from it's the individual areas. And if, some, if, if one team would have beaten the other, let's say 41 to nothing today, the guys on the short end would have gone, hey, what's going on down there? It, it's the pressure that the respective communities put on the ball. The ball players are smart enough to know that this is, this is a preseason game. We're trying to get better. The coaches know that. But boy, Jacksonville and, and, and the Carolinas, they both the communities want to win this game desperately. They want the bragging rights to go with it. Second and seven. And the pass is caught at the 34-yard line by Gordon Laro, a rookie out of Boston College. Andre Ware seems to have the short game, uh, have the short arm. It's the, the out pass he's had trouble with. We saw it early on a while ago on a third down and uh, tried to throw the out over through an open receiver, but he's he works good on the short pass over the middle. It works good on the short flare. Just that deep out that's troubled him ever since he came into the league as the number one pick for Detroit. Third and two for the Jaguars at their own 35-yard line. 11.45 left in the fourth quarter. Carolina leading 17-14. to 14. And Ware throws it at the feet of Gordon Laro. And it's fourth down. So we're disgusted with himself, and as we stated before, a guy really trying to win a job and work his way back into the National Football League. And if he doesn't do it here, you wonder where he might do it. Mm -hmm. And well, that man was open. What's so often unfair, uh, that who says life is fair, but coming in and trying to make a showing in the latter stages of a preseason game, when really the best players are over sitting down, is not easily done. Ryan Barker's kick, fielded by Tyrone Poole. Flag is down. Poole is tackled at the 26-yard line. That was a 48-yard boot and an 8-yard return. And Red Cashin will tell us about the infraction. 
Berline and Ware discussing things. Where Berline? <laughs> Over there. Illegal block in the back against the Panthers. During the return, illegal block, number 43. 10 yards, first down and 10, and that's a timeout. So the Panthers will take over deep in their own territory. 11.29 left in regulation. The Panthers on top by three. Yes, they do play OT for season. Picnic atmosphere in Canton, Ohio. Hall of Fame Day. Great celebration continues all week long. Culmination today, Carolina and Jacksonville having at it. And Jack Trudeau comes in. He is the third Panther quarterback. His team leads by three at the 12-yard line. First and ten. And Trudeau to go to the air. And his first pass is picked off by Santos Stevens. And they say he was down at the 21-yard line. So it was tipped, and then they are going to say that Stevens actually came up with the ball on a hop. Yeah, they're going to say he trapped it is what and happened. And he grudgingly has to acknowledge that yeah. with a nod there. Tried to get away with a pick, but it didn't happen. Let's take another look. Yeah, Kellen Winslow was right on top of it, too. He picked <laughs> up that tip. You can see the ball deflected right there. Does it hop? It's a great effort by Santa, yes, but clearly it's between his forearm right here down on the field. Right. So Trudeau on second down and 10 now from the 12-yard line, the former Colton Jet. He gives the ball to Randy Baldwin. And Kevin Winslow has joined us in the booth, one of the new enshrinees, the great former tight end of, of the Chargers. And Kellen, as far as most people are concerned who have watched the game of football, you could have gone into the Hall of Fame <laughs> in one late afternoon and early evening in Miami in one of the most incredible performances you, ever. Share with us your feelings about being inducted into the Hall of Fame today. Well, it's a bit overwhelming. We've been going ever since we've got here, and I don't think the real magnitude of what has happened to me today has sunk in. I think when I get home uh, sometime next week and get a chance to gather everything that's going on, I will realize just how uh, magnificent it is to be one of 180, one of which is right next to me here, in the uh, Canton Hall of Fame. You know, Kellen, as I can look back over your career, and we had so many Charger games on Monday night, uh, the one game that I remember more than any other we didn't have, and that was the playoff game against Miami in yeah. 81. 16 receptions, I think it was. Uh, 13. Uh, well, it gets bigger enough. every year. Well, it, it will get bigger, but I mean, at the end of that game, they literally had to take you off the field. Yeah, it was uh, mostly cramps. My back cramped up, my uh, back of my legs had cramped up, and it was difficult to walk. Although I wanted to, in a symbolic gesture, walk off the field because I walked onto the field, I guess I was a weaker of the bunch and couldn't get off the field, so they had to help me. That number's taken lost in uh, a lot of people's translation of that game, and you blocked the field goal. Yeah, in, uh, in the regulation, four seconds left to go. It was during, back in the days when they had a leaper, and you can leap over the top, and I went over the top to tip the ball. I'll never forget it. I can tell you that for sure. Thank Kellen, you. I know that a, a year ago, I'm standing here, and I'm talking to Jackie Smith, who's being <laughs> inducted right. into the Hall of Fame, and now I'm talking to you, both of whom you had a chance to play for Don Coryell. If you like to catch the football, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? It doesn't get any better. My going to San Diego was a perfect marriage. You had a system that loved to throw the football, very versatile, and the first thing that Coach Coriel said to me when I got off the plane in San Diego and went to the press conference was not hello, not how are you doing, <laughs> but how would you like to play some wide receiver? And ever since then, we were throwing the football. Oh, yeah, and of course, Dan Fountain. You mentioned that uh, up on the steps today, your teammates in San Diego. Uh, that was one of the great offensive football teams that was ever assembled. Well, you have to look at the talent around whenever you evaluate a player to see just how good that player is, how dominant that player is. You've got to look at the talent around him. You change the talent around Troy Aikman, he's an average quarterback. He is not the great because he's got Michael Irvin out there and, and Harper out there. Well, not Harper anymore, but he's just surrounded by Emmitt Smith, etc. It makes it a great, great ability for him.
Kellen, we had a chance at halftime to do a little feature on you, and things seem to be going extremely well for you uh, these days. They're falling into place. Football after Thank life. God, they're falling into place. Yeah. Going back to what you said, if you took away a lot of talent that surrounded you, it might have taken you one more year to get in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> at least one. Not much, believe me. <laughs> Kellen right now. Very unique. Kellen right now is the radio voice of the Missouri Tigers. That's right. I want you to know, I kept that chair warm before you got it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Kellen, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific. Yeah. Congratulations. Appreciate yeah. it. Terrific. And everybody back home, very, very proud. Thank, Thank you. you. Kellen Winslow, the great former Charger tight end. Spectacular career and, of course, uh, accentuated by that Forgot how incredible big performance against the... Miami Dolphins after the 1981 season. Mark Brunel is back in the game at quarterback for the Jaguars. He played some in the first half. It's third down and seven. And a lefty from Washington dumps it off. And this is James Stewart. The Tennessee rookie takes it down to the 36-yard line and the first down. Out there, that was a screen against the blitz. Nobody picked up the blitz. But the pass was completed. And nothing but open field. 18-yard pickup and a Jaguar first down at the Panther 36-yard line. I remember Kellen Winslow when he was in high school in East St. Louis, Illinois. I remember him when he was at the University of Missouri, which is where I met him for the first time. And Frank, it's to follow up on what you oh. said. First time I met Kellen Winslow, I could not believe I was looking up at a tight end. Whoa, oh. Stewart fumbles! And Brett Farinez recovers for the Panthers. More to that, Dan. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone that big with the moves he had. And he literally would wind up, then move him, Coriola, move him out the wide receiver, and he could work out there just as well as he could inside. No, exceptional. Well, Stewart shaking his head. A couple of flashes of uh, brilliance today, but problems as well for him. A rookie, Al. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> A rookie in his first encounter with other NFL ball players. I don't think it'll be his last, but I, I, he's, he's, he's shown a little talent here in this game. That touchdown he scored where he went up and over the top was one of them. From the 37-yard line now, this is Randy Jordan. Tries to pick up the first down and is very close to it as he is shoved out of bounds at the 47-yard line. Randy Baldwin picking up close to 10. Game's nine and a half. They'll spot it just shy of the first down. Second down and in inches now at the 46-yard line. Time left in the game, 8.45. You know, Baldwin is one of those backs that are trying to give an opportunity to become a, a true running back. He was a fine kickoff returner, led the AFC a year ago, and he's getting a good look to see as a running back. The up back now, this is Judd Garrett. His brother Jason is the quarterback at Dallas who led the Cowboys to a Thanksgiving Day victory last year. Garrett out of... Princeton picks up the first down. Mm -hmm. Your father, an old teammate of mine, uh, I think still associated with the Dallas organization as a scout. Quite a family of football players. First and ten at the 48-yard line. And Trudeau hands the ball off to Randy Baldwin, and he is tackled back at the line of scrimmage. A three-yard loss. Mike Thompson, a rookie from Wisconsin, with the stop behind the line of scrimmage. Yeah, Thompson was their fourth-round draft choice, and a guy that, again, fits into the long-range picture of an expansion team. This is, you can afford to bring a guy like that along a little more slowly, expose him to what's going on, uh, nurture him a little bit, and it's, it's an opportunity that Tom Coughlin and Dom Capers both have. They don't have to make decisions as to what is the best thing for next week. They can be a little more prudent. On second and 12, Trudeau under pressure and incomplete. Third down, Gonzalo Floyd was pursuing Jack Trudeau. You look at uh, the Carolina Panthers as an expansion team with Frank Reich, Jack Trudeau, and Kerry Collins. They've got better quarterbacking 
than some established teams in this league. Mm -hmm. And more of it. Well, and Don Beebe and Pete Metzlarz and Mark Carrier as receivers. Uh, well, just the quality of their quarterback. Like uh, mm -hmm. You don't think expansion team when you look at what they've assembled in that uh, in that trio. And, and they like their rookie, Jerry Colquitt. Deeper, certainly, than most as well. Third down and long, and it's caught at the 37 and a half yard line by Darrell Frazier. And it'll be in that precise because he had to get to the 38. They pick up the first down by about... Well, maybe they picked up the first down. They did. Now they signal first down. They got it by inches. Frazier, a rookie free agent out of Florida. That's what, uh, that's what the assistant coaches will be coaching and looking for, a rookie to know the yardage he needs. The timing was perfect between Trudeau and Frazier, and they pick up the first down. First Trudeau with a fine arm. He, he had some good years I mentioned earlier at Indianapolis. He perhaps would have had a lot better record there had he not gone through a couple of severe injuries. Came to the Jets a year ago and performed well for them, particularly in training camp. Looked well. Before the snap, false start. Number 87 on the offense. Five yards, still first down. We're going to get a chance to see Jack Trudeau's college coach later on this season. Mike White. Mike White at the, That's right. Uh, well, we, we assume Mike's going to be in Oakland. <laughs> We're going to see him somewhere. <laughs> 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 We're going to uh, see the Raiders somewhere along the line. I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> We're not going to Oakland. No, but we'll have the Raiders twice this year at Denver and at San Diego on Monday night at the 42-yard line. I wonder where they'd be coming from. Randy Baldwin. That's an interesting question. Well, no matter what happens to the Raiders, they're going to continue to train in L.A. this year. A lot of them have purchased homes down there, I guess. Yeah, the Raiders are going to train in L.A., fly to Oakland for their games. The Panthers are going to train in Charlotte and bus to Clemson, South Carolina for their games. That's Just only for, what, two years? Uh, one, one year. At least the Raiders are st staying in the same state. Although, really, North and South Carolina, this is, this is their team when you talk to the people down there. There's not much of a state boundary as far as they're concerned. And that's why they are designated the Carolina Panthers as Judd Garrett takes it to the 35-yard line. They'll have that new stadium in downtown Charlotte ready for play next year. So their temporary facility is a good two-and-a-half-hour drive from Charlotte in Clemson, South Carolina. And I guess actually, even though Charlotte is where the stadium is, I guess their training complex is what? About 15 or 20 miles south of Charlotte, actually in South Carolina. In Rock Hill. Yeah, right so across it's, the border. You know, it's Jacksonville, the old Gator Bowl, they've put about 140 million into that too. You've been there a few times, Al. You bet. I have too. Yep. The old Gator Bowl. Now known as Jacksonville Municipal Stadium, at least uh, for the moment, until somebody buys the rights to rename it uh, in their honor. On third down and eight, the catch is made for a first down of the 24-yard line by Brian Wiggins. And a Texas Southern, another of uh, several wide receivers, trying to win a spot on a big-time roster. Again, Jack Trudeau displaying a fine touch. Taking a little off it, making it a little easier to handle. I've always liked him. He is. He can throw the ball deep really well. He's got a good out pass, and he has got the touch over the middle. Four and a half minutes remaining in the fourth quarter. The Panthers leading by three and threatening again. Running his way through the middle is Tony Smith, and a flag goes down. He takes it to the 16-yard line. Tony Smith is a former first-round draft pick for Atlanta. Didn't show much there, and came here as a free agent. And this one is coming back with 421 remaining in the fourth quarter. Illegal shift. Two men were moving at the snap. Five yards, still first down. You know, all things considered, there haven't been, for a, a first preseason game, uh, an extraordinary number of penalties today. No, I agree with you. I think it's been... We, well, we've been here, and we have been here with veteran ball clubs, established NFL teams, and seen a lot worse than this. Mm -hmm. Much worse. First attempt at the 27-yard line. Fuller. 
one time Buffalo Bill taken out of bounds after a pickup of about three. The Goodyear Blimp Spirit of Akron is providing the uh, the aerial views. And of course, Akron not far from Cam. In fact, uh, the two cities share an airport halfway between the two along I-77. There it is. The bright blue summertime sky above Dan Deardorff's hometown. Mama at the game today, Dan? Nope. She's just about a mile and a half up the road. She mm -hmm. prefer to stay home and listen to you on television. Uh, I ho hope she has a Nielsen book. <laughs> Second and 12. I, I think I'm a throwaway. It's you and Frank that she really <laughs> listens to. I'm, she usually comes. Though. I'm an add-on. Oh, yeah. I think it's... Uh, Mom's getting to the age where I think uh, trekking through the stands doesn't have the allure it once had. So are we. <laughs> You're finally admitting it. <laughs> Partially. Conditional. Third down and nine upcoming. At the 21-yard line, 340 remaining. <laughs> Jaguars already the best in the AFC Central. That's where they'll be, the Panthers in the NFC West. And to the 21-yard line goes Eddie Fuller. Of course, it'll be fourth down in the field goal attempt upcoming. Charlotte uh, being geographically situated to be in the NFC West. <laughs> oh, absolutely, along with Atlanta, New Orleans, and St. Louis. Well, I guess next year they will be forced to do something in terms of realignment. It's going to be very difficult, to, I think, to get the three-quarters vote you're going to have to get. Only one of 28 owners, uh, Jacksonville and Carolina, will not be voting on that, but it'll be tough to get... 21 of 28 teams to agree on alignment and therefore it probably will wind up being designated. But they've got, that's right, they've got to change. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to please everybody, but uh, alignment in some shape, manner, form is going to have to come. And geographic means nothing. When we come back, Casey will attempt the 39-yard field goal. Ohio, the annual right of midsummer to open up the preseason. 39-yard field goal attempt by John Casey here to try to put the Panthers on top by six. And the kick is good. Dom Capers has watched his team extend its lead to 20 to 14. And let's get a word with Lynn Swan. Swanny? Thank you, Alan. Someone who was clapping for that field goal is with me right now, Jeanette Capers. She is Dom Capers' mother. And Jeanette, this is the most important game you've been to, isn't it? That's, that's right. This is the most important sports event I've been to. Yes, <laughs> your, with your son being, being the lead character. Yes, <laughs> being head coach. Now, a lot has been written about Dom since he's taken over the head coaching job of the Carolina Panthers. One of the things is about how meticulous he is. Has he always been that way? He's always been that way. His, Where does he get it from? From his father, <laughs> not from his mother. <laughs> there was a story in the newspaper that said that he was so meticulous that he would even trim the grass with a fork? Yeah, he was that, that way. He keeps his yard that way, he always kept his yard like that. And his na the neighbors, he mowed their yards. And of course, they all thought he was a whole cheese because he did everything <laughs> for them like that. Now, you must have been pretty excited about Dom coming to Pittsburgh, being the coordinator there on the defensive side, and even happier, but you don't get to get a chance to see him as much now that he's in Carolina. No, but I talk to him every week, and I'm happy because this is what he wants. Well, I think you'll be able to see a lot more games on television. He should be very successful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right, Swanee, Boykin returns the kick to the 34. I know one thing. Anybody who would trim a yard with a fork better be getting paid by the hour. I wish he lived next to me. <laughs> he did all the neighbor's yards and everything. Where are people like this when you really need them? What does mother call him? The whole cheese? The whole, the whole cheese. cheese. The whole cheese. You think that might stick with you for a while? <laughs> Moms will do that to you. <laughs> the whole cheese. But the whole cheese's team is up by six, 20 to 14. Carolina, 257 left in regulation. Jacksonville at its own 35-yard line. And Mark Brunel out of the shotgun now. Fires into the middle. The catch is 
made up at the 49-yard line and hold in there by Charles Davenport for a first down. There's a good look why they like Brunel. Again, a reminder, Tom Coughlin said he has the best arm in our camp, and good look at it right there. First and 10 from the 49-yard line. And an inside handoff to Stewart. Takes it across the 50, gets it to the 49-yard line. It'll be second down and eight. Clock ticking down, 2.20 left in regulation. As in the regular season, if the game is tied at the end of the fourth, there is overtime. And it's fired to the 30-yard line, and it should have been caught there, but it was dropped by Shannon Baker. And it'll set up a third down and eight. And Brunel right on the numbers once again. Delivers it right in the seam. Should have been handled by Baker. Those are the ones you've got to handle if you're going to play in this league. That ball was thrown perfectly. perfectly. <laughs> It'll be third down and eight at the Carolina 49-yard line. Here comes Here the blitz. Come on the blitz. But Brunel gets it away. The pass is incomplete. Good coverage on the play. And the blitz was on. They sent six. Tyrone Poole, among others, coming in to put the pressure on Brunel on his fourth down. And he tries to get it out to Shannon Baker again, who's still running his pattern with a blitz going on. That's the hardest part of the passing game that takes the longest. The blitz recognition by all 11 people. Everybody adjusting what they're doing because of the blitz and making something happen because of it. And it's not just the people picking up the blitz. It's no. The receiver has got to be aware, be reading, be on the same page with the quarterback. And Dom Capers giving an indication of how he will play things in the regular season on that play. Fourth down and eight at the 49-yard line. Brunel throwing yes. and caught for a first down at the 37-yard line. On fourth and eight, he finds John Morton for a first down how as close, we get to the two-minute warning. How close did Brunel come to going over the line? Great presence. He knew he would not get the first had he run the ball. He threw it for the first down. Next Saturday on ABC's Wide World of Sports, what's becoming a great tradition at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the Brickyard 400. Jeff Gordon heading a, a stellar field. And the International Race of Champions from Talladega in Alabama comes your way next Saturday on ABC's Wide World of Sports at 4.30 Eastern and Pacific. Gordon won that Brickyard 400 last yeah. year. I know because I was there <laughs> and that was fun. Now Brunel on first down after converting on fourth down. Takes off and has another first down and dives to the 20-yard line. And Wayne Weaver, hopeful that his team can pull it off here in the waning moments of the game as Brunel and intentionally downs it to make it second down and stop the clock with 137 left in regulation. Oh, I don't think I'd have really given up a down. to do that. <laughs> I mean, uh, that was just wasting it down. Yeah. He's got 137. He still has two timeouts. Two timeouts, and uh, that was a... Uh, <laughs> no. Well, that's what experience will give you a little later on in life. Yeah. No, at that, with, with that many timeouts left, that much time left, you don't give up a down. But this is a very impressive drive by Brunel. <laughs> it is second and ten. Jacksonville at the 19-yard line. And Brunel avoids the sack. Directs traffic, takes off again, runs out of bounds at the 16-yard line. Boy, there's a smart play by Brunel because he takes off and runs in the direction of the missed blitzer. The blitz comes from that side, he evades it, and then takes off in that direction because he knows there has to be a hole in the defense of that side. Smart play. That missed blitzer was Paul Butcher. And it's third down and six. So you watch the blitz come in from the lower right-hand corner, right there, and that's smart. Brunel makes him miss and takes off to that side. See, that's just 
That's just good, instinctive football. Third down and six now at the 15-yard line with a minute and a half to go. And Brunel fires into traffic and it's incomplete. The defensive back at his back to the plate, Derek Brown at the goal line. But covered well, Alan Haller was there with him. Now we look back at the wasted down earlier and we still have 125 on the clock, so they had no time problems. Tried to squeeze it in to the big tight end yeah. and good coverage in the end zone. But this, you're right, Frank, <laughs> this is where you love, it'd be third down right now and, and put yourself in an awkward spot. So fourth down at the 15 yard line, fourth and six. They blitz from the corner, the pass is complete, it is caught by Derek Brown, he takes it to the four, it'll be first and goal. And they'll use a timeout to think it over. Well, say one thing about Dom Capers, he is running this Carolina defense just the same way he did in Pittsburgh. They're blitzing off the corners on every down. Tyrone Poole comes again. Here he comes right here, and he gets his shot on Brunel, but not before he rifles one in there. And that is a good-looking play by Mark Brunel, standing in there, taking the shot, and then finding Derrick Brown. Now, smart, smart, good football here by, the by Brunel. Exception of that miscue, killing the ball on first down. This has been an exceptional drive. Yep. Watch him stand takes. there. That's not easy, folks. Tyrone Poole will actually pull up a little bit. You know it's coming, and it's... Taking one for the Gipper, it's... Uh, you don't know he's going to pull up. <laughs> so one timeout remaining now for the Jaguars. It'll be first and goal inside the four-yard line. 121 remaining, fourth quarter. The Panthers leading by six. Again, he was going for Derek Brown, who's become his man on this drive. Derek Second Brown down. would have had to have mitts of steel to handle that. Brunel is really pumped up. This is where he's got to get a hold of himself. He's not played that much. In actual combat, as we mentioned earlier, he was only 12 of 27 in the two previous years at Green Bay, playing behind Brett Favre. There's a lot of excitement in that field right now. This is preseason, but a very important game is... Gary Richardson, owner of Carolina, looks on. Second down, goal, 117 to play. Keep it on the ground. Stewart fights his way inside the two-yard line. Third and goal upcoming. And Jacksonville will take its final timeout. Tyrone Rogers and Mark Thomas making the tackle. So third down and goal from just inside the two-yard line. Mark Purnell out of University of Washington. Big enough, tough enough, and obviously capable. Has, as Dan mentioned earlier, the best arm in Jacksonville's camp. But he's had some really heady plays here on this drive to begin back at his own 34-yard line. So the Cougars... <laughs> the Cougars. <laughs> uh, uh, the Cougars. Cougars. I told you yeah. to the 59-minute uh, mark, uh, right? <laughs> By God, we almost just, made it. Just, just wanted to see if you were still with us. We all, oh, uh, I get it. That yep, was a that test. Was, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Washington State. <laughs> <laughs> Palouse. <laughs> oh, I said Washington. <laughs> 13th play of the drive. I thought you were saying it was a mercury salesman call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Third down and goal from just inside the two. David Selden with mercury. <laughs> Jacksonville down by six and it's lofted out of the end zone. Little timing play, but uh, John Morton would have had to have been about nine feet seven to make the catch. Fourth down. 
never has a game of football meant quite so much in Jacksonville. Well, that might be stretching it a little bit, but the fans looking on down there, now they must have their hearts in their throat. Well, Kevin Gilbride sends it in. We'll see what... Uh, now Brunel is nifty. He's not afraid to run it. Actually, if they have something that at this early in the season... Oh, now Carolina kind of takes a, the timeout. If they have something to give him any kind of a rollout yeah. option, it would be a good call, but it might not even be in the playbook yet. And a timeout for the defense with 108 to play. The ball game on the line right here, just inside the two-yard line, fourth down and goal. It's Carolina's defense rest. Hmm. Which it won't do very often this season. No. No, the two... Uh, the two units for both of these clubs that will be on the field an awful lot will be their defensive units and their punting units. <laughs> we left out kickoff return. That uh, that may be busy as well. And don't forget our opener <laughs> of the regular season, Labor Day night, Monday night, September the 4th, the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants at the Meadowlands. A great way to open up our 26th season of Monday night football. You guys drop in a little early and I'll... Uh, be a little treat. Al, you've taken up the game that Dan and I love so much. Uh -huh. We run around Wingfoot a little bit. We'll be there. Consider, <laughs> consider us there. <laughs> you know, Frank, an invitation like that once extended, very difficult oh, to retract. I'll never take it back. <laughs> so it's fourth down and goal. Jacksonville down by six. Cornell under center. Throws into the end zone, incomplete at the goal line. Steve Lawson, the defensive oh. back with the coverage on the play, intended for Mike Williams. Oh, it was an outstanding play by Lofton. Boy, got a hand on the ball. Brunel's probably arguing that it was interference, but... Well, Lofton's on a couple of penalty flags early in the game. At that time, he timed it out beautifully. And now the Panthers simply have to run out the clock from just inside their own two-yard line. Top of your screen. you got to play the man when you're down on the goal line tight. You can't give him anything into the end zone, and Lofton didn't. Perfect coverage. Wouldn't give him anything into the end zone and took it away from him. Mike Williams was the intended receiver, and he was snuffed. So Steve Lofton, who played in the World League with Montreal and as a reserve with the Cardinals for three years, was out of football last year. Trying out with the Bengals, released by them, trying to win a spot here. And he has, in all likelihood, just cemented a uh, Panther win. Or at least uh, cemented another week for Steve Lofton. At least. Well, if the name of the game is to be noticed, that's how you get noticed. Mm -hmm. So they'll have to run out the clock. They'll have to run couple of plays from inside the two-yard line. What Lofton has to hope for is that Dom Capers has moved beyond saying, you know, that was a great play by 27. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's hoping that he's been in camp long enough that the, that the <laughs> yeah. face is starting and the name are starting to be equated with the number. One it's awful tough for these guys when you start out to separate yourself from the rest of the field. One more non-fumbled kneel down is all it will take for Jack Trudeau to wrap up a Panther win. And that will do it. Clock will run out from here. Well, a highly competitive game. I think both teams will be relatively happy, all things considered. He's showing enough things to build on, and there it was, the NFL debut of the Carolina Panthers and the Jacksonville Jaguars, with the Panthers winning it 20 to 14. And congratulations to the uh, big cheese. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Dom Capers. And uh, Lynn Swan is corralling Dom, and let's... Uh, hear from the coach, which we will in just a moment, as we go to Lynn Swan. Swanee? Thank you very much, Al. Dom, I think we should leave it up to you to describe how you feel about this first win. 
Well, I uh, I hope that all of our wins aren't that tight. Uh, <laughs> that uh, can put a lot of gray hairs in your head uh, just starting out right out of the blocks. And I talked to your mom. She was rooting hard for you. She said this was the most important game she's ever seen. Well, it, it was nice to come back home and start out with a win and get a win under our belt. Uh, we know a lot more about our football team after this game than we did going in, and we'll continue to, to hopefully progress throughout the preseason and, and uh, we've got an awful lot of work to do. I know it's going to take a little time to sit back and look at the film the review how everybody played but let's talk about your quarterbacks and their performance and how you feel about that. Well I think for the most part they did a good job uh, you know like a lot of first games we had a little error here or there that hurt us in drives but uh, the biggest thing and the biggest difference in the game was not turning the ball over on offense and then turning the ball over three times on defense and that's the way most games go whoever wins that takeaway giveaway normally wins the game. It seemed that you settled them down offensively like you wanted to for the second half. Well we went out and, and uh, we put together some drives and uh, moved down and got some points on the board. Defense Dom Capers all the way. Well, we wanted to come out and try to set the tempo, and we want to be a, an aggressive attacking defense. Uh, Tyrone Poole had the big interception for the touchdown, and, and uh, we fortunately made the play there at the end, but uh, we don't like to take it down to fourth down. Where they score, they win, and if we make a play, uh, we win. But uh, fortunately, we made the play. So when you go back and you evaluate this game, what are the things you're going to change? What are the things you want to adjust most? Well, as I mentioned, we have an awful lot of work to do. This is a start, uh, the first time that our players have ever played together. You really didn't know a lot what to expect. They've worked awful hard. I'm happy that we were able to come away with a win because I think we'll be able to, to learn a lot from both the positive and the negative and build on that. And, and uh, we need to go back to work and, and uh, get a lot done this next week to get ready for Chicago. You told me something I thought was very interesting. You said for 17 years as an assistant coach and coordinator, you'd always watch the games from the booth. This was the first time in that amount of time you were going to coach it from the sideline. You were concerned about your perspective of the game and your view. How was it? Well, it was a lot different. Uh, 17 years sitting up there looking down on things, and now you're on the sideline. Uh, but I'm sure that I'll adjust. <laughs> How do you feel? I was standing next to the players. Donnie Shell, who was one of my teammates in Pittsburgh, got down to the crunch time. They're on the goal line. I saw him run out there. He wanted to get out there and play the game. Well, we have a lot of enthusiasm among our players right now. The thing that I'm the most encouraged by is our players. Is they've done everything we've asked them to do. They've had a great attitude, and uh, hopefully we can take this win today and just build on it. Now, we realize that the most important thing for you is making decisions about players and how you build this team for the future. But when it came down to those last few seconds, what was the only thing on your mind? Well, I was hoping that we would make the play that would give us a chance to come away with a good feeling. There's such a fine line in between whether you have a winning team or a losing team and what we saw out there today, this game could have gone either way. And that's the way that most games go in the NFL. And, and uh, if you're 8-8, eight eight, you're an average team. And if you're 6-10, and ten, you're a loser. And, and uh, if you're 10-6, and six, you go to the playoffs. And normally speaking, there might be a couple plays in the season that make a difference whether you go to the playoffs or you're a losing team. So we just have to find a way to come together and try to make those plays at the critical time Unfortunately, we did today. One of the things before the game that Kerry Collins told me, he said he was happy that the coaches told him that there's no pressure on him to be a starter right away. He has the opportunity to learn and not have to jump in like a Drew Bledsoe did in New England. Will you continue to put him in that position until he's ready? Well, that's the approach we'd like to take with Kerry. We think that Kerry has an awful lot of ability. I think you saw some of it out there today. And, and uh, we would like to bring him along slow, give him a chance to learn the system before we put him out there and, and put him in charge of everything. Well, congratulations on the first game for the uh, Carolina Panthers. You come out of the winner. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Lynn. Al? All right, thank you, Lynn. Carolina wins it by six. They go to Chicago, play the Bears at Soldier Field Friday, and the Jaguars go to Miami to Joe Robbie Stadium to meet the Dolphins on Friday. Well, among the things back this year on Monday Night Football, Hank Williams Jr. Let's take a listen. <laughs>
It's time to play. Football's coming on tonight. So get ready. I mean, get ready. Are you ready for some football? For Monday night party? Yeah, do the little Hank and I'm back and I'm ready to get this thing started. So put the teams on the field and get them pumped up right. Cause all my rowdy friends are back for Monday night. for Monday night. Yeah, everybody is a fan. Yeah. This is the biggest part, man. Yeah. We got the boys and Al and Dan. They're going to get it kick-started. Printing men are all set. It's the time that is right. I'm a ready friend to hear on Monday night. That's Carolina wins it 20 to 14. Gents, a fun way to get the season started. Uh, the newly minted teams, and it was a highly competitive and an entertaining game. I was impressed. I've been coming to uh, Canton, Ohio, the Hall of Fame game for many, many years, and we've seen a lot worse teams. Personnel-wise, we've seen a lot worse games. And I did Tampa Bay, I did Seattle in their expansion teams. These are two far better football teams in their initial year than both of those clubs in their expansion year for obvious reasons. Well, they have, yeah, they have a lot more talent. They have a lot more experience. They have many more veteran ball players. It's going to get a little tougher for them, though, here on out because each one of these teams has holes. They, you know, both of them have, I think, a great deal of work to do with their offensive lines. They've got some areas that aren't going to be easily filled for them. And as the competition picks up as we get closer to the Labor Day weekend, we're going to find out that they really are expansion. Teams. How do you think they'll finish? Uh, I think if either one of them wins uh, five games, they ought to be proud of themselves. Absolutely. I'd say, uh, say five. Yeah. I'd say three or four. Yeah. We'll talk to you from San Diego. It's the Chargers hosting the Minnesota Vikings. That's a week from Monday. That's the story from Canton, Ohio. Al Michaels for Frank Ifford, Dan Deardorff, and Lynn Swan saying so long from Canton. Next Saturday, on a special edition of ABC's Boy Bowl of Sports, NASCAR's best battle in Indianapolis in the Brickyard 400 Live. Then, Wide World continues at its regular time with the next international race of champions. Plus, we begin coverage of the World Track and Field Championships. Now stay tuned for your local news at World News Saturday over most of these ABC stations. The AFC-NFC Hall of Fame game has been brought to you by... Kellogg's, with good taste, nutrition, and value, the best to you each morning from Kellogg's. Beachwood H. Budweiser, the king of beers, this Bud's for you. Old Spice Soothing Gel that takes the heat out of shaving, and now you've got proof. And Ford and your Ford dealer, have you driven a Ford lately? This has been a presentation of ABC Sports, recognized around the world as the leader in sports television.